I request Dr. Arvind Kumar, the professor and head of the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, to kindly give the welcome remarks for the national webinar. The floor is yours, sir. Good afternoon, honorable vice chancellors, Madam Professor Anupurna Lodiyaji of HNB Central University, Garhwal, Lieutenant General Dr. M.D. Benkates of Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Honorable Rector of JNU, Professor Chintamani Mahapatra, Distinguished Guest of this webinar, Sri Sasadi Chari Ji, Ambassador Maya Raj Gopalan, My Teacher, Professor K.P. Vidya Lakshmi, Professor of American Studies at JNU, Professor Badrul Alam, Expert on American Studies, Dr. Deja Ji Avinandan, Resource Persons, Research Scholars, Colleagues, Invitees, our postgraduate students, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, I have great pleasure in welcoming you to this national webinar on a very pertinent theme, the US presidential election 2020. I'm grateful to you for accepting our invitation and for your participation. This webinar has been organized in collaboration with Kalinga Institute of Indo Pacific Studies, which in a short span of time has made, has made a name for itself under the guidance of Rajinda Ali Mahapatra, Director of JNU. I am thankful to you and your team for this collaboration. The theme chosen for this webinar has gained salience due to the forthcoming uh, US presidential election and the type of debates which are, which are happening in the, especially in the last uh, couple of months on this issue. It is very interesting time, especially if someone is following the ongoing campaigns by both the Republicans and the Democrats. The domestic and the global issues are featuring prominently in all the uh, dialogues or debates happening in the United States. And these debates again are centering around mostly on the trade and tariffs, free education system, whether they, they could really be able to provide that. Immigration issues again is becoming a part of major debate, healthcare, climate change issues, economy, and obviously all the various other foreign policy choices we take concentration on Iran. So this whole exercise in the next two and a half hours, we would like to discuss not only the domestic issues, which is going to impact the larger voting behavior of the American citizens, but also we'll see that how best, in fact, this election, the way they are focusing on the various foreign policy issues, how that is uh, to be understood by the rest of the world in general and India in particular. What influence can be drawn by the voters, obviously, will remain a part of discourse in this exercise. Now I request uh, Madam Vice Chancellor to preside this meeting uh, to chair this particular session. Thank you, one and all. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Arvind Kumar. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Professor Arvind Kumar, Head uh, DGIR Mahi, and uh, Professor Chintamani Mahapatra, uh, the founder of KIPS and Rector JNU. Uh, Mahi and also the keynote speaker Sri Sheshadri Chari, whom I am seeing just I think uh, after one year. And uh, I was very keen to meet him. So this uh, webinar has given me this opportunity to meet him. Uh, I am very happy to see my friend uh, Vijay Lakshmi and ambassador, <laughs> all ambassadors and all scholars and participants and the uh, moderator of this session. Uh, as I uh, will not take much time because uh, there is a time limit. So I would just like to say that this is a very pertinent topic and it's a very burning topic. And, and when the uh, whole world is looking towards the United States of America for leadership, that role is also missing. So in this election, this will also be seen that how America gives direction to the world and the society which has been divided by various uh, various uh, uh, various uh, concerns and various uh, divisions are there on the basis of race, uh, on the basis of color and etc, etc. And even the democratic process is also under doubt when the president himself says that the transition of power will be will be difficult or he'll, he'll have to think about that. So uh, in this background, when the whole country seems to be divided, uh, and when sometimes the Democrats have the lead and sometimes in some states the Republicans have the lead, this election is uh, going to be very interesting and the whole world 
uh, has an eye on on this on this election and the us us image is also very much uh, rests on this uh, on this election that in which direction it is going and the uh, and the whole world is looking towards the us for its uh, its uh, its guiding role and particularly if we talk about the about india uh, what is happening in our borders we are also looking towards the us elections very eagerly so i'll not take much time because there is a time limit but i uh, i am looking forward towards a very valuable and uh, very valuable deliberations um, by all the speakers and particularly the keynote speaker of this session uh, shri shishadri chari and i once again like to thank you and uh, send my warm wishes from hnb garhwal university to kips and to mahi both and to all the speakers and my dear friends from this forum and it's very nice to see you visually thank you very much and now i invite professor chintamani mahapat sorry first arvind has already spoken so i would like to invite professor chintamani mahapatra for his inaugural remarks and uh, then we will proceed further professor mahapatra namaskar <coughs> good afternoon to all <coughs> honorable vice chancellor and chair of the session professor annapurna notia Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Manipal University, Lieutenant General Dr. M. D. Venkatesh, uh, Sri Shashadri Chari, uh, very frontline strategic analyst and also a good friend, and of course Professor Arvind Kumar, with whom uh, I have uh, discussed many many times before we finalize the topic and the date. Today is 26th of September. After two days, 29th of September. the first round of presidential debate is going to take place in the united states since 1960 that country always conducts a debate between the presidential candidates and the vice presidential candidates only twice it was not done that was in 1968 and 1972 otherwise almost every year it is being done those who understand the dynamics of american politics know very well that the presidential debate may or may not be consequential somebody can be a great debater and lose the election on the last time in 2016 hillary clinton performed so well and she also got large number of popular votes but she could not get elected even then this kind of presidential debate is very important because they are highly competitive very informative and the two candidates they prepare very well before they come for the debate because this is a debate which is not choreographed nobody knows what kind of questions may come up and what uh, uh, the competitor or the rival political rival is going to argue in what way so in a way it is a very tough time for the candidates and this is the second most uh, important event viewed by a large number of people in the us the first being of course the super bowl and now the presidential debate and around the world probably the only election which is watched by millions of people around the globe so the timing of this seminar has been set in such a way that people who are trying to understand the american politics at this critical time they will have some kind of background before they listen to the presidential candidate uh, on the 29th of september ladies and gentlemen we are all going through a difficult time and of course the indian indians are also going ahead with the election in bihar but for the united states it is very very difficult time this is not the only difficult time when the americans have decided to go for the election there were elections in the midst of the civil war in the midst of the spanish flu about 100 years ago and even during world war 2 but this time around there are nine important issues Uh, which are going to impact or already impacting the american election process number one of course is the americans are facing the worst ever health crisis in their entire the history and you know the way the trump administration has handled that pandemic is being criticized around the country and probably in other parts of the world as well the number of people who have been killed by the pandemic is the highest in the united states the number of people who have been infected by the pandemic highest is the united states 
And in fact, the South Koreans, an American ally has done 100 times better in handling the crisis in terms of, of course, counting the death than the United States. Secondly, the severe economic downturn that is going on in the USA, both the unemployment rate is very high, there are closures of the businesses, bankruptcies in thousands, all kinds of commercial activities, in, including tourism and entertainment, all have come to a standstill. And number three, the economic cold war, uh, if I can say so, between the US and China is ravaging on and the Americans are going to vote. And the, both, the, both the two candidates are trying to tell the American people who is tougher on China. And then, uh, as uh, Annapurna Ji has already said, you know, when the whole world looks at the United States as one of the greatest democracies in action and experiment, and right now a sitting president is saying that peaceful transition of power is questionable because that depends on whether the election is going to be fair, free and fair or not. Who is going to decide free or fair? Trump will decide. So Americans are completely unsettled. They, they don't know whether in America, uh, the leading democratic country in the world, the transition to power is going to be peaceful or not so peaceful, they're, they're talking about it. For the first time in American history, large number of people are going to vote through May, about 80 million of them. Nothing new, but this time the number has probably doubled because of the pandemic. And of course the country is painfully going through the social instability, racism, police brutality, Black Lives Matter movement going on. On top of that, the wildfires in the West, and of course, cyclones, and very high temperature in California and uh, other parts uh, of the USA, they're having a really tough time. To add to that, very recently, I think from 2016 onwards, we are hearing how the Americans are vulnerable to influence of the foreign powers. And this time they think the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians are going to influence uh, the voting behavior in the United States and they're concerned about it. Very interestingly, you, you have very old candidates. One is, 19, one is 74, other one is 77. And if Joe Biden would win the election, he would be the oldest president in the United States and in 1974, the same Joe Biden was the youngest senator in the United States. So in this kind of background, the country is going to hold the election, a galaxy of speakers, and those who are going to chair the system are very, very knowledgeable in the field. I'm sure all of us, including the students, are going to learn a lot in the next couple of hours on what's going to happen in the USA. Everybody is anxious within the USA, outside the USA, including the candidates and the political parties. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to be the inaugural speaker. And of course, we're going to hear more uh, interesting and knowledgeable views on this field. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Mahapatra, for your very valid points. And it's very correct uh, that the way the US is behaving, uh, it's a first class word power but it is acting like a uh, like a third world country this time due to the reasons which you have spelled out so nicely and you have also spoken about all the challenges which the us faces and how the whole world is looking towards the us uh, for some kind of guidance so it will be decided only in november what is going to happen but this is a very good forum to discuss all these issues so with these words uh, now I would request for presidential address uh, to the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General Dr. M. D. Venkatesh, uh, to give his uh, to give his presidential address. Uh, so, uh, 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 Lieutenant General M. D. Venkatesh, uh, please deliver your presidential address. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Professor Annapurna Nautial, Honorable Vice Chancellor of H. N. B. Gadwal University. Professor Chintamani Mahapatra, Rector JNU, Sri Sheshadri Chari Ji, Ambassadors, Distinguished Speakers, Scholars, Faculty, Students, and other esteemed participants. It gives me immense pleasure to address this timely and relevant national webinar 
on an important theme of greater relevance to the global security environment in general and India to interest in particular. The outcome of this presidential election will have consequences for the rest of the world. Every four years when it comes for the American voters to elect the president of United States of America, the elites of the policy making and strategic community in countries across the world cleanly watch and follow the US presidential election campaign and wait for the outcome. Given the primacy of United States, uh, United States has on the global security environment and its strategic influence in the politics and economics of the international system, it is imperative for the countries around the world in general and India in particular to follow the evolving developments. The growing opportunities as well as challenges inherent in India's relationship with the United States makes it significant for India to closely watch the US presidential election 2020 and analyze its implications for India. The Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party have had their respective national conventions and officially chosen presidential and vice presidents and nominees. On the Republican Party, the incumbent president Donald Trump and his vice president Mike Pence will rerun for the election and the Republican National Convention clearly echoed the call for four more years of President Donald Trump. The Democratic Party has chosen former Vice President Joe Biden as the presidential nominee and Senator Kamala Harris as their vice presidential nominee. The Biden-Harris campaign and the Trump-Pence team have much to disagree on issues of both domestic policies and foreign policy of United States and the political complexities will be something to watch in the days to come. On the other hand, the Republican Party will highlight what the Trump presidency has achieved both on the domestic and foreign policy fronts in the last four years and why a win for Biden Harris team will not be good for America's interest. On the other hand, the Democratic Body uh, Party will be attempting to show how the Trump presidency has negatively impacted the domestic milieu and has led to foreign policy outcomes that are detrimental to the America's interest and why the American voters need to vote for a change of guard at the White House. Amidst the contradictions, controversies like foreign interference in US presidential elections, role of social media giants in influencing voters, and the issues of American supremacy and the Black Lives Matters movement, there has been America's presidential elections is at crossroads. And the question for the existing dispensation led by Mr. Trump, question on his handling of the COVID a situation in the US, the economic status within the US and this conflict with the China in trade war adds to the divergent views which are being expressed in, in, the, in the, the opposing parties. And add to it, Mr. President Donald Trump speaking about not so you know, smooth transfer of power in case he loses the election has, um, you know, has put up a very interesting proposition to the rest of the world to follow. And as Madam clearly put it, that uh, this is not what one expects out of US presidential elections. And the controversies and the contradictions abound. And this makes it uh, quite an interesting uh, situation to be in. And um, in the days to come, given the impending presidential debates and the vice presidential debate, it will be important, it will be important to follow keenly. Therefore, it gives me immense pleasure to address this galaxy of well-known experts and young scholars who are in the academic sessions to follow during the rest of the day, will deliberate and debate the varying dimensions of emerging contours of an election that will have ramifications for global peace and stability. To what extent the changes and continuities in US foreign policy orientation after the outcome of the election would impact the contours of India-US relations will very much depend on India's own foreign policy choices and strategic calculations. It will be important to understand these complexities. I heartily congratulate the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, MAHE, and the Kalinga Institute of Indo-Pacific Studies for taking this initiative to convene this national webinar on a very pertinent and important theme. I have no doubt in my mind that today's discussions and deliberations will be enlightening in terms of both its academic and policy relevance. I wish this webinar and all the delegates attending this webinar all the very best. Thank you very much. Jai Hind.
thank you so much, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, uh, for a very uh, valuable presidential address. And you have highlighted very important points. And I would just like to add that uh, the atmosphere of fear is present in the US. And it is not only in the public, but uh, you can see it in the president also. That he is so fearful about the uh, about the verdict of the election results that he wants to sabotage the democratic process, and that's why the image of the president, uh, president and the U.S. has uh, has declined in the eyes of the of the allies uh, like Canada, Japan, Australia, Germany, etc. And they are also seeing the U.S. in a very poor light. And now I have a very a very a prominent keynote speaker with us, Sri Shishadri Chari, who does does not require any kind of introduction. And uh, before uh, before inviting him, I would also like to say one more thing in a very lighter note uh, that uh, uh, the Kips and uh, Professor Arvind are they are organizing so many webinars that sometimes I also get jealous. And I would uh, I would I was thinking that uh, maybe one day they'll also invite me. So this is the most important day, day that they have invited me to be the part of this seminar. So I am again thankful to them of thinking about me and inviting me to virtually meet all of you, all of the dignitaries, all of the scholars and all the participants and particularly uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor and Professor Shishadri Chari. So thank you Professor Mahapatra and Professor Arvind for giving this opportunity to me. With this note, I would like to invite uh, Shri Sheshadri Chari for his valuable deliberations and I am also very keen to, to hear what is his opinion about the US elections in 2020 because Ed, as uh, uh, Lieutenant General Venkatesh said that it is going to affect India's foreign policy also. So uh, I would I would like to invite you with this note. Please give your keynote speech. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam uh, Vice Chancellor. Uh, Professor Nautiyal, uh, Vice Chancellor of uh, Mahi, Lieutenant General Dr. Venkatesh, uh, Professor Chintamani Mahapatra, Professor uh, Arvind Kumar, uh, my colleagues in the department and uh, students. Um, uh, at the outset, I must say that uh, we have a really a galaxy of speakers in this session and the next session also. And uh, going by the kind of uh, inputs that uh, the earlier speakers have given, especially uh, Dr. Uh, Venkatesh and uh, Professor uh, Chintamani Mahapatra, uh, I should confess that uh, I am not an expert, but I am still learning the ropes, we can say in the army language, as they say. As uh, uh, Dr. Venkatesh very rightly pointed out, uh, every four years, uh, the Americans get active about elections. And just as the Americans get active about elections and what impact it will have on their lives, uh, a similar but a little more frenzied activity begins in India. The Indian activity is much more frenzied than what happens in the US. Because uh, US and India are two democracies which are closely associated with one another. The politicians in India, business community, the academic world, everybody begins discussing the impact of the American elections on India-US relations. And it is very natural also, and uh, not only natural, it is extremely important and essential, especially in the present context. Uh, over a period of time, if you see, the relationship between the two of the world's largest democracies have uh, witnessed a number of highs and a number of lows. We have had a lot of setbacks. We have had, we have made tremendous progress also. Uh, we have moved forward. We have moved backward. All these things have happened, in fact, very, for a very long time. And uh, this, uh, you know, it's very difficult to say uh, that uh, which of the two political establishments in the US, the Democrats, and the Republicans, uh, who, who has done maximum good for India or when has the relationship between India and US been the best? It is during the democratic uh, dispensation or during the 
um, Republican dispensation, it's very difficult to say. One will have to go into so much of detail. Um, uh, Professor Arvind Kumar is an expert on this. He can he can name the, all the presidents of America right from probably for the last 400 years. Uh, I'm not an expert in that subject as of now. Name of, uh, let us say, Lyndon Johnson, and then uh, who was a Democratic representative, then Nixon who was a, a Republican, and then Ford, again a Republican. And it was during uh, Ford's uh, Republican uh, presidentship that India experimented with the first nuclear test in 1974. So this 1974 brought actually US and India face to face on a very different uh, kind of a situation. Uh, and then of course came the regime of Carter and then um, Reagan. But 1974, I must also mention one more incident of 1971. The 1971 Bangladesh incident also flared up a little bit because US was not very happy at that time. US of course was uh, very closely associated with Pakistan for very various reasons, uh, mainly because uh, after the Cold War, the U.S. There is a very famous adage in the U.S. If you are not with us, you are against us. So because we were not with uh, neither with the U.S. nor with the U.S.S.R. during the Cold War, we pursued a policy of non-aligned movement. So seeing us as a part of non-aligned movement, they were not very happy. So they they made this application of you if you are not with us you are against us so because we were not with them we were supposed to be against them and they aligned with pakistan and this gave them i mean like in 1971 the us placed uh, uh, their seventh fleet in the indian ocean to threaten india but there are reports of course uh, that uh, uh, the us also approached beijing and wanted to uh, wanted China to create a third uh, front in the Himalayas, but of course that did not happen. Why China did not do it uh, is a question of uh, research, and uh, that is a subject of another seminar. But more importantly, the fact is that China kept off uh, the India-Pakistan Bangladesh Liberation War for various reasons. But nevertheless. In, that brought U.S. directly in sort of a confrontation with uh, India. But again, 1974 happened and then the emergency happened and then it took quite a lot of time, say another 15 years for the two sides to mend relationship. But even as the relationship was being mended and so many other things were happening, uh, in between, of course, <clears throat> the Russian invasion of uh, Afghanistan happened that increased the dependence of us on pakistan considering the fact that uh, they could not have gone into afghanistan through central asia they could not have gone into afghanistan from iran and afghanistan being landlocked they could not have gone from the sea route and they could have depended either on india or on pakistan but the best was that they depended on pakistan and that is why the importance of pakistan became even greater as far as us is concerned and this had a bearing on india us relationship then, of course, came the most important element of 1998. Um, Professor Arvind Kumar will pardon me if I'm wrong on this. I think it was 11th May 1988, 1998, when the second Pokhran test took place. That brought directly US into the sort of, a, uh, they imposed sanctions. But these sanctions and 1998 second Pokhran test also gave India a great advantage. They gave us an opportunity to approach the U.S. and tell them of our sensibilities, how U.S. should take into consideration India's sensibilities as far as our security is concerned, our regional security is concerned, the importance of India in the region is concerned, and also our strategic outreach. So our strategic footprints are more important for India. This we could impress upon them. And from there, if you see, 19, uh, in the year 2000, uh, U.S. President, who represented the Democrats, uh, Clinton visited India in 2000. And from there, if you see, slowly the chart begins to grow towards a greater progress. And then came 2004, Dr. Manmohan Singh's regime started in 2004, and that signaled the beginning of the taking the to the logical conclusion the issue of indo-us nuclear deal 
and if you see a little bit from the indo us nuclear deal situation onwards then to a very very large extent there is no as they say there is no going back we have been able to go from uh, progress to progress as far as indo us relationship is concerned now in the present context there is a huge amount of uh, issue that has come up the post corona virus pandemic is going to be a totally different situation as far as indo us relationship is concerned the whole world is looking at a different kind of a situation where people really do not know not only people even countries do not know what is going to really happen uh, as as um, uh, somebody pointed out there are three scenarios as far as us election is concerned one is a uh, joe biden democratic uh, sweep of the polls that is one possibility the another possibility is a trump victory but a divided congress so is it going to be a total victory for trump again but at the same time he may lose the congress the senate may be uh, a little bit of a difficulty for trump and then what happens in that case will trump be able to carry forward all his agenda as he has been doing so far if you see the trump administration they practically the trump administration went back on a number of things that obama had successfully uh, gained for example the uh, obama's uh, uh, idea of joint comprehensive plan of action jcpoa with uh, uh, with iran that went for a toss trump pulled out of it trump regime went very tough on iran and also frowned upon all the countries that are, that, that that were having trade with uh, tehran the sanctions regimes also extended to russia uh, through that countering american countering american adversaries through sanctions act what is called caatsa which was imposed on all the countries uh, like india that made major defense purchases from russia and uh, our energy security came under severe strain because of the sanctions on iran and our defense security calculations had to be reworked because of the delays in finalizing su23 and s400 contracts with russia now will trump continue to play the anti china card uh, post his election is to be seen now the contrary to popular feeling that joe biden may go Uh, slow on china during his uh, one of his visits uh, to uh, china joe biden came very strongly on uh, china as far as the reports uh, go uh, there was a report uh, about joe biden's visit to china which categorically said that uh, joe biden was not happy the way things are going as far as china is concerned so this 2020 election it should not it would be very wrong on the part of indian uh, intellectual community to think that joe biden may go slow because he called xi jinping the authoritarian chinese leader quote and quote a thug he even threatened if elected to impose swift economic sanctions if china tries to silence american citizens and companies he went to the extent of saying this he said the united states does not need to get tough on china but then he wrote in his winter essay uh, in foreign affairs that it is a wholly totally changed situation and uh, uh, there is many another interesting article uh, in foreign affairs in 2018 this article was published by um, uh, campbell campbell and uh, eli ratner both are supposed to be advisors to joe biden and uh, they say across the ideological spectrum we in the united states foreign policy community have remained deeply invested in expectations about china about its approach to economies about the economic policies about democratic policies security and global order now the policies built on such expectations have failed because china has failed to change so i think in the going by all these indications as far as joe biden or trump is concerned 
India will have to work out its own foreign policy formulation vis-a-vis -vis US, vis-a-vis -vis China. So I think we have a very, very long list of things to do and not to do, but more importantly, things to do. And uh, I'm uh, eagerly awaiting the next session when experts on this subject will be able to really suggest a way forward as far as what India is supposed to do and what's supposed not to do, whether it is Trump administration, continuation of the Trump administration, or it will be the continuation, it will be a new administration dispensation in White House under Joe Biden. Both ways, what is it for India? What are the implications for India? What are those things that India has to work out? What about India-China relationship? What about India's regional outreach? What about the trade relationship that India has with various multilateral forums? And more importantly, what happens to our security and strategic calculations that we have been making all these years? So these are all some of the issues that are open to debate and discussion, agreements and disagreements. So I am eagerly looking forward to the next session. And as I very right, very, as I said in the beginning, I am not an expert on this subject. So I would really expect uh, the experts in the next subject, next session, to educate all of us on this. Thank you. Very much. Uh, thank you, Chari uh, ji, uh, for your valuable uh, speech. And uh, uh, I would uh, like to say that uh, uh, from nowhere, uh, it was indicated that you are not an expert on India's foreign policy or the US elections, the way you have said things, right. you have given the projections, and you have also talked about that uh, India has to chart its own foreign policy uh, in view of its own interest. So I think you are already an expert, and the next session will definitely be very, very interesting. So I think we have uh, overjumped the time, so I'll not take much time because the other panelists are waiting for other sessions, uh, but I would like to say again a thank you very much to uh, Professor Arvind Kumar and Professor Chintamani Mahapatra and to all the both uh, excellent speakers, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Mahi and uh, Sri Sheshadri Chari uh, and uh, Professor Chintamani Mahapatra and Arvind Kumar for their uh, beautiful and very, very important speeches who had set the stage for the further discussion and dialogue uh, about uh, the US elections in 2020 and its impact on India. And because uh, as uh, Professor Chari, uh, Chari ji said that uh, there is a debate going on in India, but you know that uh, in Indians have a habit of debating. That's why the book was written, Argumentative Indians. So we argue on everything, but that is good also because by argument you can you can discuss so many things and then it gets it gives opportunity to others to get enlightened. So with this note, I again uh, uh, send my warm wishes and heartfelt thanks to everyone uh, for giving this opportunity to me and from my side, namaste and thank you so much. Thank you so much to all the speakers for speaking so beautifully on the subject. Over to Monish. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, Ma'am, uh, Professor Anapurna Nautiyal, and uh, my heartfelt thanks on behalf of the Department of Geopolitics and our collaborator in the webinar, Kalinga Institute of Indo-Pacific Studies, uh, to all the distinguished speakers who have graced uh, the occasion in the first session and really uh, set the framework and the ground uh, for debate and discussion to continue uh, in the following sessions. So without again wasting time and without further ado, we uh, go straight to the first uh, academic session uh, on domestic issues in US presidential election, uh, which will be chaired by Professor K.P. Bijalakshmi uh, from the Center for Canadian, US and Latin American Studies at JNU. And uh, the other speakers will be Mr. Vinit Krishnan, who is a PhD candidate at the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, and Ms. Marilyn Engtipi, who is a senior research scholar at the US Studies Program at JNU. Uh, over to you, ma'am. The floor is yours. Thank you, ma'am.
Ma'am, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, I forget. <laughs> I keep forgetting. Part of the pandemic training, you know. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Manish, for uh, introducing me. So I'm sure, you know, uh, the subject needs no introduction, but I did. So thank you for introducing me uh, to the audience who absolutely does not know me at all. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's also my duty to thank uh, KIPS uh, founder, Professor Mahapatra, whom I have uh, I know very well, <laughs> Professor Arvind Kumar from Mahe, but uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, Lieutenant General Dr. Venkatesh, and of course, Vice Chancellor Anapurna and uh, Sri Sheshadri ji. All of you, thank you for a wonderful inaugural, which uh, indeed has been a curtain raiser for our discussions throughout this evening. And I, I know that we are, uh, you know, uh, time bound. And so I can't, uh, as is the wont of many teachers, ramble on philosophically before getting to the point. But I think there is much to be said, both philosophically, ideologically, and even emotionally, because US elections invokes so many strong uh, passions across the world uh, that I must say that this is something, this webinar is very timely. Now, there are two things. I know of, there are two very young scholars, and I am very happy to be sharing this, but I thought I'll set this uh, session's framework a little bit. Uh, the first thing, there are three or four propositions I think we should look at when we look at the US elections. And I've been, you know, it's my lifetime's work, I think. I work on this all the time. And I invite you all, next couple of weeks, we're going to have two seminars on, on uh, the US elections just after the debates. Uh, but uh, I would be sending invites. But uh, uh, the first proposition is that this is a very unique election. And you need to flesh out why you think it's a unique election. And uh, for me, um, it's not only a referendum on Trumpian politics. It's not so much about his economics. Reganomics was very important. But Trumpian politics has overtaken every other aspect, including the current crisis that's brewing on whether or not he will announce a Supreme Court uh, nominee before the election actually happens uh, because of the uh, sad demise of Ruth uh, Bader Gainsborough. Now, this is the level of politics that we are saying. So it is also unique because uh, on the one hand, uh, we saw a lot of jockeying in the Democrat field in the primary where there were so many Democrats who wanted to be heard who wanted to show what they felt about the route America should take and who were willing to come out and ask for a vote. And that was very impressive because in the Republican side, there was obviously an incumbent uh, president uh, normally does not face very uh, any challenges from his own party. But nevertheless, the Democrat crowd was so, I mean, the Democrat field was so crowded uh, that one was surprised. And there were a number of women who were asking uh, to be nominated by that party. That's another unique thing. And finally, of course, it culminates in Kamala Harris, Senator Kamala Harris's uh, vice presidential pick of uh, uh, Vice President Joe Biden. And that's also unique. The third unique uh, uh, reason why this election is unique is also because I think the domestic issues and foreign policy, we are very fond of saying, oh, well, you know, foreign policy has a separate set of propositions, this has separate set. In a way, I'm seeing a lot of blurring and I'm seeing a lot of things coalescing around a number of issues. We are not able to, least of all is the uh, issue about the pandemic. It came from Wuhan, China. And, you know, whether we like to call it the Wuhan uh, virus or the Wuhan crisis, nevertheless, it remains a uh, global pandemic. It is not being controlled by one country, one city or one, you know, they're just there's nothing. I mean, there's just borderlessness at the, uh, uh, you know, most alarming level. Given that, what about the other issues? Now, health issues are also becoming, whether you want to be supranationalistic, whether you want to be uh, constituency specific in your election speeches, only talk to your base and so on, you can't do that anymore. Things have blurred. You have to ask yourself whether you will be a candidate who will take the cooperation of others for the vaccine or you'll only rely on an American one. So that's again, another uniqueness where domestic issues matter. And this had started actually with Clinton himself, uh, that is President Clinton. Uh, but over the years during Obama's time after the financial crisis, there was a very clear understanding 
that you know uh, foreign policy begins at home so that's another proposition that's really becoming a very strong uh, layer in this election because there's not much both sides can actually do because everything is out of the open so i think that's a very important uh, reason why we think this is a very unique election and a very important and crucial election then the third uh, the second set of propositions would be, which which i think most of you scholars must be grappling is that is trump a disruptor or is he has he accelerated in the last four years a trend that was available to uh, all scholars in american politics even earlier that is this extreme polarization this enormous partisan divide on appointments or nominations on the bitter fights and generally you know the lack of a civility in the debates itself was it something that predates trump and it was accelerated or was he the prime disruptor was he the one who changed foreign policy we are fond of saying that he is the one who started anti immigration is that really true you know so things like that because immigration is again another issue where you can see both domestic and uh, a foreign policy dimension to it and again how do we really find our scholarship to navigate which part of it is going to actually speak to the voter on the day he goes to vote or she goes to vote so that's again another important disruption is he a disruptor the second is the kind of trade and technology disruptions that we have seen in this election period i think you're seeing uh, i think one of the speakers in the earlier session mentioned about foreign interference that's all done through technology disruption so but it has impact domestically because people believe certain types of social media they don't know it's not from a proper source and so on and so forth so this disruption you know is trump a disruptor is technology disruption going to affect this election you know how do we take this proposition forward then the issue of how trump laid out three main um, what would i call a framework if you like or a grid in which he has built his other policy uh, uh, you know potentially policy but also some of it is yet to come but most of his policies are on this one is the trade uh, focus i mean focus on trade and restrictions on uh who can trade with america now laced with america first or americans nationalism techno nationalism to every kind of nationalism and of course uh, we'll come to race in a little bit but that's one thing the second is about the trade uh, i mean immigration restrictions you know banning countries uh, of uh, muslim ban and all of that got overthrown by the uh, courts but is that a the issue that's going to haunt both the parties during this election and the third of course is of course i understand that the other sessions on the security security and strategic uh, uh, movements whether he is you know he has been so hard on uh, allies he has said to europeans especially to germany that he's going to withdraw troops and a number of things so you know the disruption in the security strategic field i don't want to go into details i don't have the time but it will be very interesting to me to see how people can stitch all these disruptions and see trump and decide whether trump's chances are that this disruption was something the americans really wanted and this will therefore be a good way for us to predict that he may win again or he may not because joe biden is also equally uh, you know arguing that these disruptions have caused great harm to america so which one's message is going to win and very finally uh, whether the mainstream republicans and mainstream democrats are going to be able to keep this fight between spilling into something that's called contested or a stolen election because trump himself has indicated that this is going to be an election which has been stolen by the democrats a typical word used by the americans but for indian uh, for us you know the word would be rigging uh, this has been rigged you know that's what we are used to hearing so this is a stolen election he has said it so many times so the anticipation on both sides is that there is going to be a claim uh, on stolen election so the counting of the mail in ballots etc so that's very intrinsic to a person who has cast his vote you know 
to tell him that or her that you know there is no validity you don't exist you are not in the you know anything can happen so that is going to be a what they call as a constitutional crisis because as you know the american system which i'm sure all of you know already is based on electoral college and the way electoral college can actually uh, you know uh, move uh, uh, a, a candidate from a loser to a winner so electability is one thing likability is another but the process itself so american elections are also unique and with this i will end because they are also process driven and process then becomes by itself another very big factor so there's another proposition altogether that after all the dust dies out we still have to wonder whether this counting is going to take forever and what then will happen and how what are the scenarios and i can of course explain some of that but i think for democrats the issues have been essentially defeat trump they are not worried because i have seen the latest polls and again now polls are giving only 4% in swing states between uh, biden and uh, uh uh trump but the swing states themselves are moving in numbers there were first six i had made up my mind there be only six and now i'm seeing at least 12 so i'm not sure either so i i hope you scholars are going to look at the swing votes because that's where uh what mr chari was talking about what does it matter to india well indian americans are voting in large numbers this year that's another great proposition for you to think about 1.8 million are going to vote and they are scattered in these swing states so now the big uh, supposition is kamala harris will she give a bounce well no not really because of joe biden's campaign talking about kashmir and caa and the number of fundraisers by indian americans have started telling biden campaign that to please tone it down or take it off we don't expect you to interfere in the internal affairs so this is a very interesting time and i think there's a lot for scholars to cover but i would end by saying this election for whoever it matters it matters the most to americans but it, at the same time it matters to india it matters to the europeans and of course it matters to the great elephant in the room the chinese and the russians i mean i mean you know even now i'm hearing about biden and his sons you know ukrainian escapade with so for who, for which you know president trump was impeached by the house but not in the senate so a lot of things are out there i hope i've given you a taste of it and i haven't taken away anything from all of you because i'm sure you will have a lot more to add to what i've said uh, but i thank you very much indeed for giving me this opportunity uh, from kits and to mahe and uh, let me now invite uh, the first speaker uh, to make his presentation Vinit. Vinit. Sorry, yeah. Vinit. Vinit, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, I hope I'm audible. Yes. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, first of all, uh, I think uh, before uh, before anything, let me just uh, also say that uh, uh, it's a great honor to uh, be selected or to be part of this particular panel, to be part of this webinar. I mean, I'm not. Uh, per se, somebody who is uh, by any means focused or, or, or like looking uh, in my research work only on on the U.S. or focused on the U.S. I work on technology-related issues, climate change-related issues, and of course, U.S. is very tangential when I when all of these uh, factors are looked at. So uh, I think, uh, Doctor, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Sri Chari had mentioned there will be experts in the next. Um, panel and i'm certainly not an expert so i'm glad that uh, the burden of the expert in the in this particular panel was taken up by vijay lakshmi man my guide's guide so uh, i'm extremely glad uh, to have such a uh, distinguished chair uh, uh, for this session as well and also i'm very glad at her remarks i was just noting what she had said down and i i guess it will become evident as i go through uh, the few slides that i've set up uh essentially the framework that she laid down is is uh, to me seems pretty similar to what i would actually be looking to cover uh going forward so thanks a lot for that ma'am that was very informative uh, and certainly cleared a lot of things for all of us i'm uh, i'm 100% sure um before i begin let me also thank professor kumar and professor mahapatra for uh, giving me this opportunity and like i said as the first speaker uh, a, a giant burden on my shoulders as well i hope i do justice 
Uh, and with these uh, few with these few words, I'd like to start. I know I've already eaten up a little bit of time. Uh, I'm just going ahead and sharing my screen now. I hope this is visible. OK, uh, so uh, domestic issues in US presidential elections, of course, is the topic uh, that has been assigned uh, for this particular panel. Um, I have uh, just for the notice of the chair as well, ma'am, I've, I've numbered these uh, slides from five down so that it also gives you an idea that uh, how much more I probably have to speak about. So if I'm ra running out of time, please uh, do give me a heads up. Uh, I'll move ahead and uh, get straight to the topic now. First of all, I think it was very interesting how uh, uh, Vijayalakshmi ma'am actually started off saying this is a very unique election. And I completely agree with her uh, on this aspect because uh, I feel that, of course, when it comes to domestic issues in any US presidential election, there are quite a few traditional issues. Uh, however, in this particular election, it remains to be question how much will they actually matter i feel sure they will matter but again how much and to who and in which constituencies will they matter so a few of them that i've uh, taken here uh, if i can go clockwise through uh, education immigration healthcare uh, unemployment or jobs uh, gun control and well climate change well i mean it's it's something that essentially is not a traditional issue as such, but certainly has been uh, since 2008 at least. So uh, I've uh, brought that in here as well. So uh, if I could start with education. Now, obviously the education policy is laid out. In fact, the policies on all of these, uh, all of these aspects laid out by either of the, or both of the parties, or both of the uh, presidential candidates itself runs into pages and pages. So I will just pick and choose one or two issues in each of these sectors. So in the education sector, I will start with the or I will focus on the issue of charter schools. Now, charter schools are semi autonomous or enjoy semi autonomous uh, uh, function. Uh, they're government funded, definitely, but they have so they have certain level of independence from each in each state uh, as far as the regulations and laws are concerned. Uh, now, Joe Biden, of course, with his wife being a public educator, has come out and said uh, that he is very vehemently opposed to the whole concept of charter schools. Now, uh, why is this important? Uh, a couple of years back, I believe it was in 2017, there were studies uh, brought out by the National Education Council which said in the, in the US which said that there has been a weak performance of students, particularly in mathematics and in reading. Uh, when you compare students in charter schools as opposed to students who have gone through the, the state public uh, uh, public education system. So Biden has come out vehemently opposed to it. Well, on, on the other hand, Trump uh, has uh, said that this will be a death knell for the black communities. And he's been stressing that point quite a, quite a bit, which I'll also come to later. But if you look at some of the statistics, New Orleans, especially post uh, Hurricane Katrina, 78% uh, of New Orleans uh, students in the in the uh, primary education sector uh, are uh, uh, actually go through go through uh, charter schools. Uh, California, Arizona, and Michigan are the three states where the most enrolled uh, charter school students are. And uh, why these states are crucial, ma'am already spoke of swing states, and I'll come to those later on. But uh, these are areas where Trump is trying to look. Uh, you would assume that the black vote, for example, would be with the Democrats and would be with Biden. But these are certain issues that Trump is trying to raise to uh, perhaps eat into that kind of uh, 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 that kind of uh, constituency as well. Coming to immigration, I think it's already been covered, so I will not dwell on dwell on dwell on it much. But um, the border wall, the anti deport, the deportation of illegals, the catch and release policies, these are all areas where uh, where both Trump and Joe Biden are on extremely opposite corners uh, and potentially could have a huge impact, uh, particularly in the border states in the South. Uh, coming to healthcare, I'll, I'll actually link it here, healthcare and unemployment and gun control, obviously three very vastly different uh, uh, issues, but for the paucity of time. Uh, Trump has been playing himself up, for example, as a job creator. He says he's created jobs in construction, he's created jobs in infrastructure, he's created jobs in energy. In to some respects, these are all true uh, as well. 
But on the other side, uh, he has also been he has also been criticizing Biden's policies as as ultra left, and he's saying uh, the fact that if Biden does come to power, uh, it's going to re repeal a lot of the jobs which have been created. Uh, the this the sen the sensex or uh, sorry the um, uh, the stock exchange will crash. Uh, and uh, similarly with gun control, he's also talking about uh, or portraying Trump is portraying himself as a Second Amendment warrior. Uh, while at the same time, he's also trying to get some amount of the Democrat vote also by saying that at the same time, I will not uh, I will be a lot more uh, stricter than other or previous Democrat uh, presidencies have been on gun control itself, speaking on uh, issues like uh, assault weapons and so on. While at the same time, Joe Biden, of course, uh, uh, would like to portray his past if when he has taken on the NRA, even though that past comes in 1993 and 1994, we have to uh, keep in mind. But still, he says he's defeated the NRA. He can be tough on gun control and particularly on assault weapons, and he will remove these weapons from the streets of America. Uh, coming finally quickly to climate change, I mean, I feel that uh, like I said, traditional issues, some of them are getting sidelined a little. Climate change now, if this were at the time when Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement, or if this were at the time when the new uh, Green Deal had been presented in the uh, House of Representatives. Now, if that was the time, perhaps this would have been one of the key electoral uh, issues. However, with all that has happened in 2020, with, as ma'am rightly said, the polarizing nature of the presidency, uh, Trump presidency itself, as well as the confusing nature of how 2020 has been, uh, some of these traditional issues might take a backseat and perhaps be only relevant to certain communities in certain key states. So I move ahead and I feel that this is the crux of how the domestic issues or how the, the electoral uh, uh, trends actually will progress. It's, it's a race of perception, it's a race of polarization, and it's a race of who best can pander to their own crowd as well as pander to the opposition's crowd. Uh, now, uh, it's perhaps undoubtedly that this is perhaps one of the elections where the US domestic constituencies have been polarized on multiple questions and extremely out of control uh, is how, it, how things are moving in the last few months as well. Uh, but at the same time, it's a perception game. Whether you listen to uh, or wh which channels you listen to on mainstream media or which social media filter bubbles you are a part of actually has a lot to do with how people are perceiving whether Trump has been, for example, one uh, strong on COVID or not, or has he been uh, taking the right side on the racial uh, question or not. And this all depends on the perception. If you see Fox News, it's one perception. If you see uh, other mainstream media, totally different perception. Now, Trump has been, for example, playing up uh, in the whole race question. For example, whether it's Kenosha, whether it's Minneapolis, he's been, he's been playing up the law, enforce and law enforcement warriors who give their lives to protect each and every American. But at the same time, the Democrat constituency has been calling out the racial uh, uh, inequality that is happening. The Black Lives Matter movement has already been speaking of, spoken of, and I don't think I need to go into it further. Coming to COVID, for example, Trump tries to say testing, testing, testing. We have tested more than any other nation in the world. True. But and he says that if uh, if if he had not, for, for example, brought in the, uh, the brought in the travel bans early on, uh, this would have uh, perhaps uh, taken uh, the numbers far higher. That is his spin on it. At the other time, the Joe Biden and his team spins it as Trump failed as a leader during the pandemic and Joe Biden would be a good leader leader during the pandemic and pointing to his role uh, coming, uh, taking America out of the 2008 uh, cri economic crisis as well. Uh, cancel culture, I, I, I believe I'm already using up a lot of time, so I'll not go into it, but I guess, yes, ma'am, two minutes. Okay, so I'll move ahead, cancel culture, I'll come back if there's a question. Uh, and then the last few things are essentially the campaign slogans. Uh, and it's very evident, Trump is trying to project the fact that US is the greatest state in the world. Keep America great. Uh, while at the same time, uh, the, the Democrat campaign has been criticized by the Republicans for being for saying things like our best days still lie ahead, lie ahead uh, and we will build back better. Uh, the question the Republicans are asking is, you do not seem to have any faith in the American, uh, American state. So how can you be the right president uh, for this particular nation? And like I said about uh, Trump has vehemently called uh, Joe Biden a socialist Trojan horse. 
while at the same time, when it comes to the polarizing nature, the bullying of uh, Donald Trump, which has been spoken about by previous presidents, including uh, Bill Clinton and, uh, uh, and uh, Barack Obama, uh, Joe Biden on that hand says he will restore the soul of America and go back to American values. Uh, so finally, it comes down to swing states. Uh, at the end of the day, like Ma'am said, initially a lot of people are talking about the six states which are uh, written at the top, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, down to North Carolina. And definitely these are all, uh, if you look at by how much the margins by which Trump won, Wisconsin in 2016, 0.7%, Pennsylvania, 0.7%, Michigan, 0.3%, Florida, 0.8%. And in a lot of these places, he was one of the first uh, Republican presidents in a long time to actually uh, corner a bunch of these states. So it will come down to how how well he is actually able to retain these states in a sense. Uh, and when you come down to the other states which I've mentioned as well, now Texas, the the uh, the the uh, uh, it's always or largely been a Republican state, and the expectation is that it probably will be. But at the same time, one interesting point here is that yes, ma'am, one minute. I'm just about to finish. Um, uh, the expectation here is that. Um, the white seniors uh, as a community who voted very vo very vocally or very uh, favorably for Trump in the past, uh, the 2016 election, have sort of a little been disenfranchised, if you can call it that, particularly when considering the COVID response of Trump. As a result, and uh, when you're looking at Texas, also looking at the uh, increase in the Hispanic vote, there is a possibility that such states could swing, while at the same time, New Hampshire and Minnesota which Trump nearly uh, took away from the from the Democrats potentially could change uh, change hands again. And finally, Georgia, uh, the black vote uh, had a big role to play in the 2008 Senate uh, election, even though uh, the, the candidate lost. It was almost the first time that a black uh, candidate had been voted into uh, power from the for the Senate from from the state of Georgia. So if you just look at all of these states in, in, in a totality, that's 191 electoral votes right then, right then and there. The top six straight away 101. So it will all come down to how well uh, these candidates I, sorry, uh, I think I got muted in between. I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I'm just ending by saying it will all come down to how well these uh, these um, um, speakers, uh, sorry, these candidates are able to uh, pander to these particular, uh, particular uh, uh, constituencies. And that's perhaps why, uh, for example, Trump plays up the coal and energy industry or the automobile industry when it comes to Michigan, Pennsylvania, etc. Thank you, uh, one and all. I have one more thing I think to go, but I will not go into that, which is essentially about the question of will Trump say that it has to go to the Supreme Court or not. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Vineet. In some ways, I think you have elaborated some of the points I raised, and I also think you looked at the very difficult issue of uh, the elephant in the room for foreign policy is China and the attitude towards China, but domestically the attitude towards race and you know the the surgeons of race and colored people. It's not just the blacks, so that's an important one. But I don't want to take so much time. Let me invite Marlene. I think the next speaker. Uh, can we uh, find Marlene? I'm not able to see her though. Yes. Hello. Um, am, I, am I audible? Yes, you uh, are. But I, I can't. I can't see you. I don't know why I have a very different set of things. Never mind. Please go ahead. I'll, uh, you know, want to spend some time for question answer. So I'll give my remarks, Vinny. Yeah. But well done, Vinny. Uh, thank you, Very well done. Uh, thank you. You start. Uh, thank you, Vinny, for the wide coverage on domestic issues. I would like to go slightly deeper on environmental issues, uh, which is political debate on environmental issues in the US moving up to the 2020 elections. This paper looks at the uh, political debate on environmental issues and how the American voters are grappling with in the run up to the presidential elections. What does the American public want? Clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, and healthy food to eat as the most fundamental human rights. However, in the simplest form, a complex calculation goes behind in the making of environmental regulations by the Environmental Protection Agency. Environmental Problems in the U.S. are today problems um, are today political problems more than scientific ones. It is divided along ideological lines across regions, whether demographics, gender, 
and environment concerns have been of increasing salience to Americans since the publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in the 60s, which sparked public ID and use of widely utilized pesticide in the wake of Silent Spring publication, DDT was banned, public attention was heightened, and in the 1970s, President Richard Nixon signed new legislation that created the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, since the EPA was created, the debate over environment became more political. Uh, firstly, like all other domestic issues, the major points of contention um, are whether the government has become too large and encroaching into areas which should best be left to the individuals or whether it has become too small and therefore unable to protect the needs. According to the Gallup poll, um, 62 percent of Americans currently see that the government is doing too little to protect the environment. Relatively few Americans over the years have said that the government is doing too much to protect the environment with a high of 17% in 2012 and 2014. This support can be seen in government energy policy priorities, including protecting the environment from the effects of energy development and, and use and increasing reliance on foreign energy sources. Likewise, the differences can be seen in party lines as how Republican and Democrats view government efforts on their 85% of Democrats and Democrats leaning independents say that government um, is doing too little compared with 31% of Republican and Republicans leaning in independents. The public opinion suggests that the federal government must do more to protect uh, water quality of lakes, rivers, streams, reduce the effect of global climate change, protect air quality, protect animals and their habitats, and protect lands to uh, in national parks and nature preserves in order to protect air quality and address the issue of smoke that resulted in deadly health issues. 50 years ago, the United States Congress passed the 1970 Clean Air Act. However, under the EPA, various environmental regulations have been enacted and also deregulated, favoring the oil and automobile industry, which have strong lobby within the Congress. Um, the president and his administration have also exercised substantial influence on the environment and um, through regulation and executive authority. Water crisis have also grown to be a serious issue for the Americans across the country in major cities and towns. Uh, drinking water directly from the Cape has proven to create serious health issues and even death for young ones. Uh, the contamination of water is uh, due to the industrial waste, aging infrastructure and weakening government oversight. One example is the water crisis in Clean, Michigan, which began in 2014, is seen as a story of environmental injustice and bad decision making. In order to cut costs, the government has shifted to uh, shifted the source of drinking water from the Detroit system uh, to Flint River, uh, which for years served as an unofficial disposal site for treated and untreated refuse for the from the local industry along the source, from car factories and packaging, uh, meat packaging and fat meals. More than 30 million uh, Americans live uh, in areas where water system violated safety rules at the beginning of last year, last year according to the data from the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Clean Water Act uh, made unlawful to discharge any pollution from source in navigable waters unless a permit is obtained. However, uh, negligence and cost, uh, cost cutting at all levels have increased water prices across the region. Uh, there is a new debate that has come up with the start of the Trump administration. Is it possible to cut back on environmental regulation and still effectively protect water and air quality? While some say trim regulation, the others say not possible. Um, secondly, the debate on whether economic growth and environmental protection as a contradictory goal. President Obama attempted to bridge this gap by redefining the environment as not and chilling, but also an economic opportunity to create millions of jobs at attempting to tie together the desperate goals of environmental protection and economic growth. The Clean Power Plan of uh, Obama administration aims to strengthen the economy through job creation in renewable energy industry, water saving in the power plants and addressing public health concerns. However, the uh, Clean Power Plan was built by the Trump administration um, by the and replace it by the affordable clean energy as they recently the new deal was Merlin, introduced in the Congress. You have two minutes, Merlin, I think. You know. yeah. um, in fact, uh, the Green New Deal that has drawn criticism from both other critics that a socialist concept of invasive government is also its feasibility unrealistic. 
struggles and the costs and, and the debate of new, um, new Green Deal continues during their democratic uh, primaries and can debate for, for their own version of this new deal too. Um, yeah, moving ahead, moving ahead, where do the candidates stand on environmental regulation? In fact, on environmental regulations, while President Donald Trump has tried to to reduce government oversight, former Vice President and Democratic nominee John, Joe Biden plans to reverse Trump regul regulatory rollbacks. In fact, Trump administration is submitting monitoring rules for oil and gas operators implemented during the Obama administration, which put limits for methane emissions from oil and gas drilling, transport and storage, um, and storage operations. In fact, re replacing the carbon capture and storage requirements of the coal fire plant, the affordable clean um, energy of carbon administration, who gave three years period to devise their own plans to cut emissions and improve efficiency. Uh, in, in fact, electricity company more time and flexibility to meet those standards. Likewise, exemption is also made uh, to plan shutting down or switching to natural gas. Um, as for Joe Biden, uh, he's uh, with climate change as a main component, he has submitted an ambitious of net zero uh, greenhouse gas emission by 2050. Achieving this goal will require reversing the current course of uh, rolling back regulations along with new uh, legislation. Um, key among his legislative proposals is an enforcement mechanism to ensure that the economy reaches the mid-century decarbonization goal and that the polluters bear the full cost, uh, full cost of their carbon emissions. Uh, Biden plans to revise the 1994 executive order and federal election uh, federal action to address environmental justice in minority uh, population and low carbon population. Um, he has established an environmental, environmental and climate justice division within the U.S. Department of Justice to address criminal and pollution uh, cases. To conclude, uh, climate change does not stand up in the top threat for voters in the 2020 elections in the polls. However, individual states, health issues, water crisis and um, issues of environmental and socio-economic justice will, um, will direct individual voters to choose their candidate. Likewise, individual voters' support for the candidate choice also reflect their leaning on environmental and political debate. Thank you. Well done, uh, Marlene. You've actually touched on a very interesting uh, note of, you know, you ended on a note of interrogation, whether it is at all a serious issue in this election. It is, because I saw the Chicago Council, as I said, the last, latest polls and, uh, you know, they have set out what is important for Democrats. And for Democrats, number one issue has been climate change, while for the Republicans, it's mostly China. So do we have time for Q&A, Monish or yes. Arvind? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we can okay. give seven, seven minutes uh, for the Q&A. Okay. And uh, uh, one housekeeping rule, anyone who wants to raise a question, you can use the hand raise bar on the right hand top. and uh, uh, please give your questions precise and be please point out to whom the question is directed to. Ma'am. Okay, thank you for that uh, information. Uh, so go ahead. Is there Are there any questions? Would anybody like to raise any questions? Because I'll just conclude later on because I want to keep to the time. So do I see the chat box or something in which I could... Uh, uh, Ma'am, there is a question uh, from Mayank. Mayank, uh, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, maybe you should handle it because I'm not Absolutely, getting, yes, the, you know, I'm not getting the correct. Uh, my options seem to be very limited Am on I, my screen. Yes, <coughs> go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, thank you so much, Ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, ma ma I had a question regarding Mayank, the... please introduce yourself. Oh, absolutely, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening to all uh, participants and panelists. I am a second year student at the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, Mahe, and uh, I have a question regarding the Black Lives Matter movement and what type of an impact uh, the panelists think it will have on the coming election. So uh, if you look at the history as well as the, the politics, politics behind, behind the movement, we see that... Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, I'm, 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 No, I can't hear anything. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Am, am I audible question? now? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Ask your question. To whom do yeah, you want? Um, 
Ma'am, I was hoping to get a general impression from the panelists, and my question was, what type of an impact do you think that a Black Lives Matter movement will have on the coming election? Because as much as it's adding to the arena of polarization inside the electoral sphere itself, but uh, on a larger trend, we can see that even more and more Republicans are becoming cognizant of race issues inside the United States. So, does the panel okay. think that in future there is a possibility that uh, issues regarding these will be met in more bipartisan standards? Okay, I see more hands. So, let me collect yes. all the questions. There uh, is a Madhuri. Madhuri, unmute yourself and please ask the question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good, e good evening to everyone on the panel and all the participants. So uh, my question is regarding the image of the United States. As far as President Trump is concerned, uh, we know that he posits this image of a bit of a loose cannon, someone who is unpredictable. And uh, how is that going to change should Joe Biden become the uh, next president? And furthermore, how would uh, the enemies, if I may use that word, of the United States uh, perceive USA as helmed by Joe Biden. For example, Iran would definitely seek retaliation for the assassination of uh, Qasim Soleimani, or China would definitely have some contentions regarding the trade war. My point is that even though these some of these moves have been sanctioned by President Trump, uh, President Biden, if that's going to be the case, he will have to deal with the fallout. So how would they deal with that? And how would that affect the overall international image and reputation of the United States if there's a change in leadership? Thank you very much. OK, then I have Jaspal Alag. Hello, Jaspal. Jaspal, are yeah. you there? Yeah, yeah. Can you Go hear ahead me now? with your question? Yeah. Uh, last elections in 2016, was the last chance for white supremacy to be established in America. Uh, Trump tried to stop the Chinese loot. He now has four years of experience behind him. Uh, it looks to me that in case he loses, there's going to be unimaginable, unimaginable loss to the US leadership of the world. Is this thought right? Thank you very much. Okay, so are there any more questions? I don't see any hands. So Monish, can you help me? I can't see the chat at all. Uh, Ma'am, I think we can go ahead and uh, take the responses. Okay, go ahead, Vineet and Marlene. Please uh, give your responses about two, two, three, two minutes each, I think. All right, uh, thank you, ma'am, if I could start. Uh, thank you, Mayank, Madhuri and Jispal for the questions. Uh, first of all, uh, Mayank, I'd, I'd probably focus on your question uh, uh, in detail because I think Madhuri and Jispal, your questions, while extremely apt, I believe the next session is going to look at foreign policy issues and how things are going to come uh, come out or play out in that in those aspects. So, if I may just look at uh, Black Lives Matter and the question that Mayank asked, uh, particularly because I had to rush through my swing state uh, uh, swing state slide. So um, I would just like to say, uh, what role would it play? I'll just look at, like I said, the swing of so-called quote-unquote battleground states, uh, the verbosity of that. Uh, anyway, um, if you look at some of these key states, right, um, you have, for example, Wisconsin, where in Kenosha, Wisconsin, there was a shooting of uh, George, uh, sorry, Jacob Blake, uh, hardly two to three weeks ago. You have Minnesota where uh, George Floyd and the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement becoming a global phenomenon itself. So, in a, and then I mentioned, I think briefly Georgia, where there is a significant black vote, uh, where uh, it, although the expectation would largely be that probably the Republicans or probably Trump might uh, take that state there, in all these places, there is a very, particular very uh, possible, very big possibility that uh, the Black Lives Matter movement as well. Let me also mention a parallel movement. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, all of you are well aware of LeBron James. Now, LeBron James, the NBA superstar, has a movement for go out and vote. Uh, now, uh, the black community has historically not been the strongest voting community. 
but there is a huge movement from athletes from uh, entertain from people in the entertainment industry and so on to influence uh, these uh, this community to, act, to actually go out and vote and go out and vote in big numbers so uh, if that does happen then things could potentially change particularly in some of these uh, some of these key swing states i hope uh, that answers the question and uh, just even though the other questions were largely on foreign policy i'd just like to say to madhuri's question about china i mean it's interesting china is certainly a foreign policy issue but it's also become a domestic issue i think uh, vijay lakshmi ma'am said about foreign interference becoming an issue and so on and it's certainly the case with china china is being played up by uh, by trump or rather the the if you look at uh, uh, the trade deals that uh, that, that had been signed when biden was in the senate uh, it, it's been played up uh, the tpp pulling out of tpp all of these things have been played up as outsourcing and taking away american jobs while trump uh, the great savior of american jobs has brought them back uh, and hence china is is a big threat to the domestic economy of uh, um, uh, of uh, of uh, families across the us so it's very interesting that from for the first time since the soviets were at their peak a a, a foreign state china in this in this particular situation is not just a foreign pol policy issue but also very much a domestic issue when it centers on things like uh, uh, jobs and employment thank you okay merlin do you want to add something <clears throat> yeah i want to add on the first point uh, when it comes to black life matters i think uh, demographic matters and when it comes to age demographics uh, it's not about just black and white and here even the age matters and i think the younger generations are uh, younger generation of white voters i mean they are also much uh, into black life matters so uh, when it comes to individual states uh, it's very tricky because uh, it also met, uh, when it rank, comes of ranking economy and everything that matters and on the other hand uh, what is tricky during this election season is because of coronavirus uh, where most of the ballot votes uh, are i mean it's absentee voting has been done in this election and 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 also uh, in fact it's a minus point for the uh, democratic party in that matters because of uh, most of the uh, voters leaning to democrats are mostly the blacks the young ones which they can have uh, a place uh, um, there they can uh, it's a place where they vote from so this is a, lit a little bit tricky situation current for uh, in these elections and the rest two issues i hope the next panel will discuss about it thank you okay so manish do i have one minute to sum up or bye bye no ma'am like certainly all, all yours okay <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to keep to the time, but it's been a great pleasure to hit this panel and start off the discussions. I think a number of things were said and we had to read between the lines, but there are three or four things that we need to keep in mind. And I think they tried answering it as best as they could, given the time. Uh, and it's, you know, uh, we are doing it in a very unique way, where, you know, very short space of time. Uh, the learning is immense. So thank you both panelists. We were very in informed. And as I said, climate change, and local issues as well as local issues, global and local issues, all of them matter in this election. But there are three scenarios I'd like you to I'd like to leave you with. One scenario is Trump wins. If Trump wins, Europe will do hedging and they'll probably go, go back to being Mr. Nice to China. This is one scenario because they don't see Trump as being very friendly to them. And so what should India do? So for the, you know, I'm not taking on the Black Lives Matter, because I think it matters. But as you know, traditionally, blacks have been supremely supportive. Those who do go out to vote have been supportive for the support uh, to the Democrats. Uh, but the real issue now, according to my research, is that Latino vote. Is Biden having a problem with the Latino vote? No, the 17 percent. It's the fastest growing minority in the United States. And therefore, the Cuban-Americans are definitely with the Republicans for a very long time. Have they changed? So. The Black Lives Movement, has it impacted the first generation voters from multiracial groups? That's what will make a difference in the swing state. Not so much about just immigration or, you know, <coughs> to, I dare say even education. To some extent, education and jobs, I think, matter to the uh, uh, citizens already in the US from various countries. So Latino vote, we need to keep an eye on that. What would they like and what would they look for? That may be a clue. 
So I go back to my scenario and I'll end with that. The first scenario is if Trump comes back, he has also been very scathing about multilateralism. So what does it mean for India when it's going to over, uh, take over the UNSC, WHO and various other things? And, you know, we have to deal with a certain amount of, uh, well, the word is transactional, but that's also overused in many ways. But I think there's a strategic navigation that needs to be done with our private understanding with the United States, which is bipartisan mainly, which I think most uh, speakers from policy world have been at pains to emphasize. But at the same time, you know, there has been a backdrop of a very heavy bonhomie between the last two administrations, both with the Obama administration and with the Trump administration for India. So India is now a strategic bet for the United States. So in many ways, the strategic partnership and its uh, rationale has, I think, overtaken or has overweighed the uh, milder electoral impulses of scoring at the electoral level. That's number one. The second scenario, <coughs> excuse me, is if Biden wins. And I think if Biden wins, the first big benefit, benefit will go to the transatlantic alliance because Europe will then not be hedging. Europe might come on board. But if Trump wins, if Europe hedges against China, <clears throat> it may look to other democracies like India to actually uh, join up and then, you know, teach uh, China some, some restraint at least. So the second scenario to me is also equally interesting when, you know, Biden wins. Will he change the policy on China? I believe not. He may be in a different way hankering after pushing China to the wall. And I think <clears throat> while he talks about collaborative actions with China on climate change, I don't think the emerging technology debate and the divide is going to allow Biden to get any closer. So the Pan-American anti-China stance is quite clear. <coughs> it just says, Monish, that I'm talking too much, but I have to take a sip of water and then do my final one. And the third scenario to me is very interesting. That is, if Biden wins, but you will still muddle through because he will not become the business as usual with China, but he will put climate change on this thing. And China has already started making some statements in the last week or so to please the Europeans mainly. But, you know, on China, by 2030 or 2060, we will do carbon imprint and something like that. But knowing China's commitments in the multilateral world, nobody is at, as, as of yet, you know, sort of believing it or anything. But there will be collaborative talks and engagement. So if there's going to be engagement in this muddling through a scenario, uh, what kind of uh, things that we can expect in India? India's biggest problem, I believe, right now is our digital problem. Apart from many others that we have in the United States, the trade, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the digital standards question. So I leave you there because digital standards. Keep an eye out for this word because I think uh, you know we have a security cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, which again the Europeans might come on in, and Europe itself might get a global role back. You know, it's not really seen a global role for the last four years. It may want to get back to that. But I think very clearly more cooperation with developing countries for climate change from even in this muddling through. So there are these three scenarios one can actually see. And if Trump wins, there will be a certain amount of uh, more temperamentally pragmatism that we need to strategically navigate what is of main interest to us. And I think we have been doing that quite well with him. And he is also very interested in uh, you know, going with India on a number of issues. So I leave you there, but the digital divide is what stopped the trade talks from going further. So even if you're the best of friends, if you can't even trade, that really leaves a lot of work for the next administration, which is coming in and for India to talk to the United States. Thank you very much, Monish. And thank you, Professor Arvind Kumar. Thank you, Professor Mahapatra. Thank you, all of the participants and the panelists and the speakers. That I was very thank you, Madam. privileged thank you to have you today. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the panelists of the session. And certainly a big heartfelt thanks to Professor Bijay Lakshmi, ma'am. Um, it's always a pleasure to listen to you, ma'am, uh, to dissect and diagnose what else the American democracy and what works for it. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, without wasting any more time, we move on to the next academic session and 
I kindly request uh, Professor M. B. Alam, who is a formerly professor at the Department of Political Science, Jamia Millia Islamia, to kindly chair this session on global dimension in U.S. presidential election. Uh, the panelists uh, for this session will be Ms. Upma Kaishab, who is a senior research scholar at the U.S. Studies uh, GNU, and Mr. Nadi Mohammed, who is a PhD candidate at the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations. Professor Alam. Professor Alam. Hello, Professor Alam. You have to unmute yourself. Professor Alam, you have to unmute yeah, yourself. Please. Can you listen to me? Yes, yeah, now we, yes, can. Sir, we can hear you now. OK, is it OK now, Manish? Yes, sir. Please go ahead, sir. OK. Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Arbind Kumar, uh, Professor Chintamani Mahapatra, uh, uh, for being a part of for re uh, requesting me to chair this particular session. I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Sasadri Chari, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Venkates, uh, General Venkates, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Professor Annapurna Nautiyal, uh, Ambassador Raj Gopalan, Dr. Manish, and all the research scholars we have, and also, of course, my friend uh, Dr. K.P. Bijalakvi. So this, um, because of the time management, I think we had got originally 30 minutes. Uh, uh, so what, I, what I'll do is uh, I'll speak for about like seven, eight minutes, and I'll also request Upma and also Nadim to also stick to the same timeline so that we can at least have five, six minutes left to take some Q&A. So I think that's the way I would like to intend to go. Uh, the topic that has been assigned in this particular session is the global dimension of the US election. Uh, Professor Bijalakmi and uh, Beneath and Madeline, they spoke about the domestic aspect. And I think there will be a lot of some of the overlapping between the domestic and also the external part. But I think this is a wide canvas. What I would like to do is in the next couple of minutes, like to flag up some of the important uh, uh, areas, I think, in which the US is going likely to go uh, either under the Trump two administration or under the Joe Biden administration. And both of them are known commodities, by the way, by this time. Uh, first of all, let us look at the very quickly at the immediate neighborhood in North America in terms of Canada and Mexico. Uh, with Canada, they have got still some issues. Uh, President Trump has got some issues with trying to renegotiate the NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, trying to the deal with the tariff issue regarding the lumber in, uh, timber industries in Canada and the personal relationship also with Justin Trudeau. And with Mexico, of course, uh, the issues of the wall and the issue of illegal migration apart from trade and commerce, etc. So how that is going to be played out, I think, uh, in the next four years, that remains to be seen. Uh, next one is across the Atlantic. You know, we have got historic for the more than seven decades, a historic Atlantic Alliance relationship uh, with across the Atlantic uh, with, with US as the predominant leader. So I think President Trump is on record of saying that North Atlantic Alliance, uh, which was a product of the World War II and since has been there, quote unquote, it has been obsolete and he would like to withdraw US from the NATO. So how North Atlantic Alliance is going to play out in the next four years from 2020 to 2024, that remains to be seen. And also the relationship with Great Britain, with Boris Johnson and Brexit and with Angela Merkel at the most, it is uh, Trump has got a very frosty relations with, um, um, with Germany and with France and how that is going to play out. And if there is going to be a leadership vacuum from the US, who is going to fill up that vacuum? Is it going to be Putin or is it going to be somebody else? I think that needs to be sorted out. And also, I think uh, one of the articles I was reading in some journal that is uh, the next president of the United States, be it Trump or Biden, is he going to ensure some kind of Marshall plan that was there at the end of World War II, pumping massive aid into because most of these economies in Europe, they have been ravaged by the pandemics uh, and a lot of the other economic issues. So is America going to do that? So that is uh, on the European things. And next uh, is on Japan, which is a very important alliance partner of uh, the United States since World War II. And we just have got uh, Shinzo Abe, uh, the post Shinzo Abe 
uh, phase in Japan under the new Prime Minister Suga. Uh, so how that is going to play out between Trump and Suga, the issues of uh, Okinawa, the military, US military base in Okinawa, the issue of TPP. I think we need, uh, Professor Vijalak spoke about Trans-Pacific Partnership. Is America going to come back to that? How about the Quad, in which, of course, India is a big stake? And also the expansion of possible expansion of quad, quad quadrilateral initiative with Japan, Australia, India, and America, and possibly some other extra countries like Vietnam, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and South Korea. So I think that is again another important issue. And also some of the regional issues like the Senkaku Island issue between Japan and China, how America is going to view that one particular issues. And also, of course, don't forget the issue in North Korea, uh, the Kim Jong un regime and the future of that one and how America is going to play out in that part of the world, whether it is Trump too or whether it is Biden administration. Next one is China. That is, I think we can have another webinar, maybe Manish and Professor Arvind and Professor Mahapatra can organize that. But with China, I think there are a lot of issues. I mean, how best to deal with China? Should we go back to the Cold War era of containment or should we go for engagement? Should we go for a mix of both containment and engagement like engagement? Uh, the issue of trade, issue of commerce, issue of tariff, issue of one belt, one road, issue of quad, uh, issue of South China Sea. I think the plate is quite full and I think whoever the next uh, uh, president of America is, I think that is also going to be very, very important. Uh, in terms of um, Russia, I mean, again, uh, we all know the personal chemistry between Trump and Putin, but how that is going to play out because after all, uh, Russia is a very important thermonuclear power. It has got a sizable amount of nuclear weapons. Are we going to have a follow up from the SALT negotiations, START negotiations, the ABM treaties like in the new life, uh, see some kind of drastic reduction or it is going to be a big war uh, in, the, in the nuclear race or in the thermonuclear race? I think that remains to be seen. And also how America is going to play out with the adjoining countries around Russia, the Eurasian territory, the Central Asian republics, etc., and how the Biden administration is going to play out that particular one. Because at the end of the day, Russia is still going to be a very, very important player, and that I think they are going also going to play a very important role. Uh, as far as India is concerned, of course, uh, um, Mr. Sesadri Chari talked about the historical relation, the on again, off again, up and down kind of relationship. And also, I think the broad bipartisan support that India has received from US, whether it is from Bill Clinton, from Barack Obama, from George Bush, whether it is Democrats and Republicans, I think India has been on a, in the last 20, 30 years, on a win-win proposition. And I think the, one of the good things about, I think Professor Vijayalakmi and also Vineet, they spoke about the role of the Indian American diaspora. I think they are playing a very, very important role uh, in this particular election. They are concentrated in some of the big cities like in Detroit, in Miami, in Philadelphia, and in many other cities. Just give you one example, like I think we need talked about the swing states. Let us say the example of Michigan, which was traditionally a democratic state, the blue state. And last election, Trump carried Michigan. Probably he won the presidency because Michigan, most of the people felt it would go to Hillary Clinton. It did not. He, uh, Trump won Michigan by 11,000 votes, just 11,000. And Michigan has a sizable 16 electoral college votes. And I think that propelled him to go over the top of 270 plus. And Michigan, by the way, has got at least 150,000 Indian American voters. So just imagine how 11,000 can make a difference. And the same thing, I think in Pennsylvania, the state that was again touted to be a blue state, a Hillary state, it, it did not go that way. I think Trump carried the state of uh, Pennsylvania and the 20 electoral college votes, which is very sizable. And Philadelphia, uh, in Pennsylvania, there are more than 160, 70,000 Indian American voters which are eligible. And Trump carried Pennsylvania by 44,000 votes. So if I think the Indian American community the vote in a big number in this particular election in some of the sizable crucial areas, even in Cleveland, in Detroit, in Dayton uh, and in Milwaukee, Madison, I think that will carry. I mean, so I, I mean, I, the other good thing about Indian American is I think if you look back in the 1960s, the Dilip Sang Son, the first Sikh American who got elected to the House that was a Democrats, most of the uh, Indian American voters, they were to put all their eggs in one basket, namely the democratic basket. But I think they have become smarter and wiser. 
So and they have also made some very uh, important strategic coalition buildings with other uh, competing ethnic groups like the Greek Americans, Italian Americans, Jewish Americans, etc., etc., Latinos, the Cubans, the Puerto Ricans, etc., etc. So I think that is also making. So I think a lot of people are already debating about the next presidential election in 2024, and it will be between one Indian American candidate with another Indian American candidate, and both of them might happen to be women. One may be Kamala Harris, the other one may be Nikki Haley. And I think that will be a very interesting proposition between a Republican and a Democrats coming to the mainstream America and trying to compete for political power. And I think that is something very, very interesting. In terms of India, I think it remains to be seen because a lot of the people, I think Professor Mahapatra spoke about, um, Professor Arbin, they uh, also write in, um, the Delhi Guardian also about this transactional aspect, the episodic aspect. I think for the most part it is true, but it is also equally true that under our current Prime Minister and also Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and before also, we have stood for national interest, what is good for our country, we always try to do that. So I think in the next four years, I mean, let us say if Trump wins, it will be like between America first versus make in India or America first versus Atma Nirbhar Bharat. So I think who wins? I mean, maybe in some areas there will be complementality, but in certain areas we we'll try to stand our ground. What is in our interest vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, security architecture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we will not hesitate to take positions, even if it differs from US, whether it is in Iran or anybody else. So I think that is also very, very important to be noted. Uh, and also I think on in terms of the uh, other areas, for example, uh, there are a host of areas, for example, in Middle East, I mean, Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, I mean, are we going to go back to the nuclear deal that Obama signed with Iran? Uh, how about the future of the Abraham Accord, which is taking place right now? Uh, because 20, 30 years ago, Israel had only relations with two countries, namely Egypt and Jordan among the Islamic world in that part of the world. But today, I think Bahrain has joined the bandwagon, United Arab Emirates has joined the bandwagon, and who knows, tomorrow Kuwait and Oman and Yemen might also join. So how that is going to change the entire political topography in the Middle East and how that is going to play out in the American um, um, global dimension or the global view of things, because at the end of the day, it is still a big hegemonic power, it is still the superpower, it is still a uh, very powerful country in terms of military industrial complex. So I think that remains to be seen whether it is Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Even if Donald Trump comes back, I think he will face a different world with different challenges, with different permutations and combinations. And of course, this pandemic, the COVID-19 has also um, muddled the entire scenario. So I think it remains to be seen. It is going to be very, very challenging to say the least. So I think with this, uh, some comments that I just flagged off, I think uh, let us quickly jump into our two presenters today, Upma Kasyap. I think I'll request Upma to speak for about seven, eight minutes, followed by uh, Nadim, who can speak for seven, eight minutes. And then I think we can take a couple of Q&A. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Hello, yes. Am I audible? Okay, Upma, please go ahead. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Arvind Kumar, Professor Mahapatra, uh, DGIR Mahi Kips, for inviting me to the seminar and giving me an opportunity to present my paper. Uh, my paper focuses on global dimensions in US. Politics. We are not able to hear you, Upma. <clears throat> uh, my paper, am I audible? Increase the volume. Increase the volume, yes. Maybe you can speak a bit more loudly. Um, is it better now? Am I audible? Upa, you are audible, but volume is less. So speak a yeah, little yeah. louder. Yes. Okay. Uh, my paper focuses on global dimensions in US presidential election. Uh, the US presidential election is supposed to be held on November 3rd and has global geopolitical ramifications since the unipolar status enjoyed by America, since the fall of the Soviet Union is facing an unprecedented uh, challenge from China. The voters will not only decide who will become the next US president, but also they will help determine the path US foreign policy takes, either working in partnership with the international community or moving toward a greater degree of national self-reliance. 
So the first question is: Do uh, foreign policy issues matter in U.S. Uh, elections? Uh, conven conventional wisdom suggests foreign policy rarely wins elections. However, failures so mishandled challenges abroad do have untoward electoral uh, foreign incumbent. The traditional U.S. role of uh, U.S. Uh, in the world has been uh, global leadership, defense, promotion of liberal international order, defense and promotion of freedom, democracy, uh, and human rights. Uh, the debate between two competing visions. Uh, isolationism and internationalism re-emerged in the wake of the Soviet Union's collapse and intensifying polarization of American politics. President Trump's brand of America first has only fueled it. Critics of Trump administration argue that Trump administration ha has substantially changed the U.S. role in world by altering the key elements of U.S. foreign policy. Next question is whether we saw an element of continuity or change in Trump administration. The Trump supporters, they cite uh, NSS uh, 2017 document where uh, large portions refer that uh, the US uh, Trump uh, policy uh, did have an uh, element of uh, continuity. For example, uh, US leadership, a general emphasis on greater power competition with China and Russia, a stronger support for US alliances, willingness to impose uh, and maintain sanctions on Russia, and a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, and then uh, many foreign policy issues uh, did loom over the US uh, elections debate 2020. And uh, to touch on the few, uh, we have Americans broadly support uh, continued US engagement with the rest of the world, but Republican and Democrats now differ sharply over how that engagement should take place and what the nation's foreign policy priorities should be, according to a survey by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Uh, Democrats see threat uh, both internally and externally, while Republicans see the threat mostly coming from outside U.S. borders. For Democrats, the five leading threats to U.S. vital interests are in order. For Democrats, the main issues are the coronavirus pandemic, climate change, racial inequality, U.S. foreign interference in U.S. elections, economic inequality in the country. And Biden's foreign policy leadership team, they clearly represent a possible return to the Bush, Clinton, and especially Obama era foreign policy commitments. For Republicans, the issues are different. The top five threats the Republicans see are development of China as a world power, international terrorism, large number of immigrants and refugees coming into the country, domestic violent extremism, and Iran's nuclear program. Uh, to touch on China, uh, pre President. Trump uh, embarked on a more combative and unilateral course as compared to his predecessors, rejecting TPP. But uh, Biden says that he would mount a more effective pushback against China that, that, than Trump. Uh, climate change, Trump has always questioned uh, whether uh, he, ex he had expressed doubts whether human activity is responsible for climate change. He has questioned the science of climate change for Biden, for um, Democrats, climate change is an important issue, the greatest threat uh, to the security. Uh, Biden say, uh, has called for revolution to address it. He has uh, released a national plan to reduce emissions and invest in new technology and infrastructure. Uh, about the coronavirus, Trump has definitely downplayed the threat of COVID-19, uh, but Biden pledges to strengthen presidential leadership and spend uh, uh, on testing and tracing and treatment and health services. Uh, now I would like to highlight the defense issues in the elections debate. On defense, uh, President Trump, he has uh, repeatedly uh, called for increasing the defense budget. And uh, Biden has often advocated for narrow objectives in use of force, and he has expressed skepticism of the ability of US to reshape foreign societies. Uh, as recent as May uh, 2020, Trump and his administration have been discussing uh, to test nuclear weapons, which, which the US has not done since 1992. The Republicans in the Senate approved at least uh, $10 million into, uh, in the 2021 budget for nuclear testing. Uh, two candidates view a nuclear weapons policy and strategy carry significance in the election because the U.S. is a turning point in deciding the future of its growing debate about the threat posed by Chinese and Russian nuclear advances. Because Chinese, they have been uh, their uh, nuclear, um, Chinese who relatively small nuclear force is growing in sophistication. And, uh, that's why U.S. feels that they should be following the path of nuclear modernization. 
so uh, this election the next president will have to deal with many pressing issues like do we want to live in a world with which a number of nuclear weapons is going up or going down and the more pressing challenge with the possible end of nuclear strategic arms reduction treaty new start which is set to expire on 5th feb 2021 uh, after a bold and unorthodox move to meet the north korean leader kim um, uh, trump administration made little substantive substantive progress progress in securing a long term uh, deal nuclearization deal and following the collapse of inf treaty the us executive and legislative branches have debated american deployments of ground launches intermediate range missiles in the pacific theater the debate will continue uh, well into the next term now the major non proliferation challenge for the candidates in 2020 is the future of iranian nuclear program the trump administration decision to withdraw from jcpoa will affect the foreign policy landscape in 2021 Biden has called Trump uh, policy uh, towards Iran disastrous and Biden has also pledged to enter the Iran deal again with some um, um, changes. So the questions which emerge are how will the candidates build in the arms control and non-proliferation workforce inside the government as a whole? How will they increase the budget for nuclear policy work in a time of strained resources? How will they better connect decisions about US force posture to our disarmament obligation? Uh, the, uh, on the issue of Russia, uh, Trump has argued for closer cooperation with Russia and Biden warns that Russia under Putin is assaulting the foundations of Western democracy. So the question arises, do a uh, US, whether the US need to rethink about its Russia policy and Russia, if we should, uh, it, it, it should be noted that Russia has re-emerged a significant player in Sudan, Libya and Syria. It has uh, deepened its ties with Israel. Uh, about the trade, the fundamental question in trade debate is not whether US should engage in trade, but what the terms of trade competition should be. Trade deals generally don't cover all factors that can affect trade flows. Protectionism creates problems of its own. Immigration, Trump has taken ex executive action to reshape asylum, deportation and visa policy. Biden supports a comprehensive immigration reform and has criticized Trump's policies. So I'd like to conclude by saying that two camps have emerged, restorationist and renovators. Restoration camp, like Biden, want to restore US position in the world to what it was before Trump era. And the renovators want to fully renovate America's role in the world, even though it's unclear what exactly a progressive uh, will look like. But the Obama era policies, the Clinton era policies, had its own failure. So it's yet to be seen uh, what the future looks like. Thank you. Sir, please unmute yourself, sir. Have you completed your presentation, Upma? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good. Very good. Thank you, sir. Professor Alam is there? Sir, Alam sir has to unmute himself. Shall we go ahead with Nadim? We are running out of time. Yes, sir. Nadim. Nadim. Yes, sir. Do, do you want me to start right now? You will start Nadim. Yeah, uh, am I audible? Yes, Nadim, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So let me at the outset uh, thank uh, Professor Mahapatra and Professor Arvind Kumar, sir, to have invited me to uh, this uh, session. Uh, I also thank um, uh, Professor Munawar Alam Saab and uh, Upma Kashyap uh, for the, their introductory remarks and their uh, points on how the US election is going to turn out and what implications would it have. I'll quickly go to my presentation. I'm going to share a slide and I'll make it as brief as possible. <clears throat> and I'll try to rule out some of the issues that have been already touched upon by Upma. Hello. Hello. 
go ahead nadeem yeah but uh, somebody has uh, it, it seems like somebody is muting me in between uh, I, i i hope i'm audible right now you are yes, audible please, please go okay. ahead and speak thank you thank you thank you no. so i'll start it uh, I'll probably touch upon a uh, few issues uh, largely concentrated in West Asia. Uh, I'll be looking at some of the prospects for change and some some of the things that probably will be continuing even if... Yes, uh it is not reflected here. Okay. Let me try it again. Okay is it visible now Yes Okay thank you So uh one of the most important points would be as mentioned earlier the support for Saudi and its GCC allies along with Israel and Egypt I think this is one of the aspects that is going to continue no matter if Trump is going to come back to power or if uh, Biden is coming uh, get getting elected uh, so this is going to stay because uh for two reasons one is that they have specific uh, strategic interests in all these countries uh, economic and military uh, interests and the other factor is that with respect to egypt um, the some of the strategic locations are are located within the uh, governance of egypt and uh, like uh, the strait of suez canal and uh, how 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 exactly us has been using uh, the strategic interest and translating it in this very small geographic location uh, the second one would be uh, to preserve their interest in um, strait of hormuz bab al mandab and the suez canal uh, so nearly more than 20% of the global oil trade happens to strait of hormuz and this is a very volatile uh, geographic region because it shares uh, close proximity with both iran and the gcc allies so this is going to uh, uh, to a large extent i think the us foreign policy uh, will be more or less the same with respect to how the us military has to preserve the strategic interest in these locations and there definitely is a larger consensus with respect to tehran as a sponsor of terrorism and uh, th- th- this this has been the case with uh, no matter what the advisors for the republican government or the uh, democrats jake sullivan uh, he is very close to joe, joe biden and he has reiterated it again and again that uh, within democrats a large e- even within democrats no matter which po- which policy uh, th- they are, they are recommending but they have a larger consensus with respect to the fact that tehran is a global sponsor of terrorism so So the, the relationship with, with Iran is going to be more or less the same. Uh, but again, uh, the point to be noted here is that Iranian le- elections are uh, also ahead, and uh, high chances, very high chances, that a hardline principalist government would be coming back to power in uh, Tehran. And we do not know how much would they be uh, willing to um, engage with the U.S. No matter which uh, administration comes back to power. So that's that's a kind of a dynamics that we have to look uh, uh, in the future. and uh, another uh, point of continuity would be uh, the us support uh, in reducing the overseas involvement of uh, the military troops so bo- bo- both democrats and uh, republicans have reiterated it uh, over and over again that they want to get the forces back but uh, there is a slight uh, di- point of difference here and i'll be coming uh, to that very shortly as i mentioned earlier some of the changes would be that the policy towards iran and possible negotiations i mean biden has uh, even the earlier uh, presenters have also t- uh, mentioned that biden has uh, had strong and harsh responses towards the uh, killing of qasem soleimani and how uh, us has been uh, uh, kind of withdrawing itself from the jcpoa so that's a kind of a situation where probably uh, we could see if uh, biden gets reelected Uh, or if by sorry if biden gets elected uh, the democratic administration would have a different policy towards iran but how much it would uh, how much of it would be reciprocated is yet to be seen because as i mentioned earlier the iranian elections are also uh, taking place and the guardian council has eliminated uh, most of the uh, moderates uh, who were willing to who were popular and who were willing to run for the elections so mostly the high chances that a, a conservative uh, hardline government would come back to power in iran uh differences in reducing troops uh this is what uh, i mentioned earlier that both uh, uh, democrats and republicans agree on the fact that uh, they have to get the overseas troops back but to what extent and how it is uh, differs because uh, for trump when he uh, talks about uh, 
uh, getting the American forces back, he mostly plays it to the gallery and the sentiments of the people. And uh, more or less, we have seen uh, more rhetorics coming ahead. But uh, with respect to Biden, he still believes that there should be considerable amount of troops in Iraq or in Afghanistan because there are possible repercussions and possible uh, possible volatilities that that are attached to the, these two countries, and they would not want to get all the uh, troops uh, back at, at at one go. Now, uh, with respect to Israel Arab normalization. Um, Th that is another point of contention here because Israel Arab normalization right now is taking place without the uh, Israel Palestine peace. And uh, that has been the case for a long time. You talk to people like Amr Musa, who has been the uh, former uh, Secretary General of Arab League, uh, even he believes the fact that there should be a kind of a peace process that, ha that, that should be taking place between the Palestinians and Israelis. But the kind of fragmented leadership in, uh, in West Bank and Gaza, it becomes an impediment. So. Uh, but one thing is for sure, there is no backpedaling with respect to Abraham Accords. Uh, this is a th this is probably one of the most uh, historic steps, uh, con especially considering the Persian Gulf region. As mentioned earlier, uh, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia are two uh, probably th the most important countries that have not wo been uh, overtly vocal about it, but there have been certain indications with respect to the normalization of ties with Israel. And also the fact that a lot, uh, some Dubai uh, private companies are also willing to uh, cooperate with Israeli firms and uh, these are the companies that are listed in Dubai Stock Exchange and if the public sentiments goes against uh, any of these companies they are going to have uh, very uh, strong responses from their investors and that might create some kind of a short term tur turbulence for some of these business enterprises but on a long term I think uh, th 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 there is an unprecedented shift taking place in this very context. Uh, I'll quickly go through some of the focus points that we probably have to watch out for uh, while debating upon uh, the US presidential elections. One is the maximum pressure policy on Iran. No matter what, uh, Riyadh, Abu Dhabi and Manama is very wary about any sympathy for Islamist movements or pro probably a kind of a sen uh, uh, the sen sentimental political Islam component that, that will threaten their own administration. So no, uh, they, they are watching for maximum pro uh, pressure policy on Iran. Um, also with respect to the fact that their engagement with the European powers also has been kind of an, in a rift kind of a situation because the Bundestag had uh, earlier reiterated that they have to suspend the arms uh, uh, sales to uh, Saudi Arabia and the present regime in Saudi Arabia because of the war crimes in Yemen. Uh, uh, but uh, the Trump administration uh, did not uh, kind of pay attention to it. The, the arms sales still go in, in a kind of a very uh, lucrative manner. So. Uh, the, the, the kind of approach and the kind of perception the uh, the Persian Gulf region, the, the, the GCC allies have towards Iran is kind of uh, uh, hostile and they, they are very wary about any kind of uh, popular widespread uh, emotions attached to this uh, maximum pressure. And uh, one more thing is also within the rift within GCC where the Qatar has Qatar and uh, uh, and Qatar has managed to kind of uh, stand up to the pressure and the relation between Qatar and Saudi Arabia still is uh, is turbulent, even though within uh, GCC they have tried to renegotiate a uh, lot of things, but still uh, the, the, the relations are not back to normal as of now. And the problem with respect to uh, any of these uh, turbulences is that the t these turbulences would not reflect exactly in Persian Gulf region. If there is a kind of a discontentment, if there is kind of disagreement with any of the partners, the, the, it will be reflected in the pressure points that will be that are mostly located in Eastern Mediterranean, in Lebanon, in Syria, and in the bordering region of Israel. That's where we're going to. Th that, those are the pressure points that we have to watch for. And uh, second aspect is the security of Kurds and the, 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 the Kurdish militias have been largely sidelined after uh, the fight against ISIS and that has been a kind of a debate. Biden has uh, criticized uh, how, uh, Trump has, uh, t t how, how Trump has reacted to the situation. Now, uh, the, within Turkey, there are large um, debates with respect to how Turkey is responding to their uh, borders uh, and, the, and their role in uh, northern Syria. The Abraham Accords, uh, one thing is that there, uh, there have been mixed responses from the Arab world. The regime has responded in a different way and large po the large pockets of societies in the, within the Arab world, they have responded in a different way. For example, what you can see uh, the picture there is an image from 
uh, Israel uh, and the, the Palestinian population in Israel, how they have uh, protested against uh, how the Gulf powers are warming up. The, the popular slogan, one of the popular slogans was, was Palestine Mashal al -Bayah. That means Palestine is not for sale. So the popular sentiments has been turning away from GCC and the kind of relations that they have maintained for a long time with GCC powers is bound to change in the coming years. War in Yemen is another critical issue. As I mentioned earlier, there have been disagreements both in US Parliament and among European powers how the uh, situation in Yemen has changed. And uh, in the context of US presidential elections, Biden probably would take a, a proactive step in, uh, in uh, kind of cre creating a positive effect of both the Stockholm Agreement and the Riyadh Agreement. US-Turkey relations is another uh, key factor here. Uh, U.S. traditionally has supported the Kurdish militias in fighting against ISIS. So, um, when 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 an attack against uh, the Kurdish militias happened, usually the uh, U.S. troops used to um, protect them. But the that has been the traditional uh, angle of uh, how U.S. has responded to the situation in Turkey. But that is bound to change because uh, the U right now there have been. Uh, the there are certain consensus with respect to US and Turkey, especially when you consider the uh, consider the situation in Libya. But on a larger note, I think there are a lot of disagreements. And um, well, if Biden com comes back to power, uh, and if uh, considering the fact that Erdogan is losing popularity within Turkey, I think this is going to be an interesting situation that we have to watch out for. I'll quickly conclude by, uh, by projecting some of the popular sentiments and statements uh, from West Asia and how they have been analyzing the presidential elections. This is an uh, editorial, the first image that you can see here is an editorial of the uh, Arab News, which is the official uh, newspaper of Saudi Arabia owned by the, uh, the ruling regime. So in that they say that the, uh, what Biden presidency would mean for them. And uh, what I, I think what the Saudi administration, the ruling regime is looking for is kind of uh, some pressure with respect to the resettlement issue because the Obama administration, if you remember, in the UN Security Council had uh, uh, had maintained a dis had distant distanced itself uh, from the Israeli annexation plans and had even uh, uh, e even uh, me uh, taken the decision to not to uh, cast the vote. So that's a kind of an interesting situation and. Um, as we know, Palestine had quit the Arab League role in protest over Israel de uh, deals. The uh, Riyadh al-Maliki had uh, declined the position. So uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, position that Palestine has has been static and it still uh, uh, is the same for, to a large extent. But if the Gulf powers which had um, helped them, which had backed them for a long time is kind of uh, rethinking its uh, role in the region. Arab News had also changed their logo in Hebrew uh, on the occasion of Jewish New Year. So that is all these are indications because Saudi Arabia has not overtly spoken against it. And uh, but within Saudi Arabia, there have been official statements with respect to how there has to be more pressure on Israel. But uh, nothing tangible has been seen. And as we know, um, UAE Israel has been cooperating since a long time and the cooperation is going to transcend to multiple sectors and energy is one of them, just like Egypt. I would be happy to uh, take uh, questions if there are any, and uh, because of the limitation of time, I thought it is better to probably encapsulate it in this form. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for patiently listening. Professor Alam? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Najib. Uh, sir, uh, just a small note uh, because of the paucity of time, uh, okay. we have to cut on the, we have to do away with the QA session. And uh, if you would like to make um, you know, a small last, last remark, okay. you can do so, sir. OK, I'll do that, OK. Uh, thank you, Upma, and also thank you, Nadeem, for making very valid points. And Nadeem, by the way, I think uh, you made very important points. It's the regime is one thing in Manama or in uh, Abu Dhabi or uh, in other places, but it is the popular sentiment that also remains to be seen. I mean, how that plays out, okay, between the regime's perception and also the popular support perception, and also the different elements in Iran, how they are going to view uh, the forthcoming administration, whether it is Trump too or whether it is Biden and Turkey and the Kurdish issue. So I think that is going to be very interesting things. I think uh, we'll see in the Arab world, in the Middle East, in, uh, in the broader pictures. I think. I think that's both of you have made some very valid points. I would like to thank Upma Kasyap and also Nadi Ahmed uh, for being a part of this. And uh, please allow me to thank again Professor Arbind Kumar, 
डॉक्टर मनीष एंड प्रोफेसर चिंतामणि महापात्र डॉक्टर नेताजी अभिनंदन फ्रॉम द कलिंग इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंडो पैसिफिक स्टडीज फॉर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वेबिनार आई थिंक दैट्स इट्स अ गुड लर्निंग लेसन फॉर ऑल ऑफ अस दैट इट्स स्टिल इवॉल्विंग लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स आर हैपनिंग हु नो दैट इज ऑलरेडी अ सितंबर सरप्राइज विद द डेथ ऑफ रूथ बैडर गिंसबर्ग एंड हु इज गोइंग टू रिप्लेस हर इन द यूएस सुप्रीम कोर्ट and again there may be an october surprise so i think we'll wait till november 3 if there is going to be an election a result by the evening or maybe it will take a couple of weeks so thank you once again to all of you thank you thank you thank you professor alam uh, for chairing the session and thank you to all the panelists uh, without uh, further ado we move into the next uh, academic session and uh, it's really a powerhouse session in the real sense of the term uh, and it's a session on major reflections on post 2020 us election uh i welcome the chair of the session ambassador r raja gopalan and uh, the speakers of the session professor srikant kondapalli uh, from the center for east asian studies jnu who will who will be speaking on us china relations uh, professor arvind kumar from dgir who will be speaking on international security issues and professor sintamani mahapatra the founder chairman of kips and rector jnu who will be speaking on india us relations uh Mr Chair Ambassador Raj, Raja Gopalan sir the floor is yours yes uh, thank you thank you manish um we are almost uh, 50 <coughs> minutes behind schedule so i'm going to keep it crisp uh, i am grateful to kips and to manipal academy of higher education for giving me this honor to chair this very important session <coughs> the first two sessions discuss the internal dynamics and the global impact of the impending us presidential election that covered uh, substantially the two sub themes of this uh, seminar uh, this session would provide an overview of the probable post election scenario uh, impacting the relations between the united states and rest of the world and we are going to focus on us relations with china and with india and also how this could impact international security issues uh, <clears throat> this session has been allotted 40 minutes we have three important uh, speakers with profound knowledge of the allotted sub themes and uh, since they would be speaking for 10 minutes each and we could have a q and a time permit i am going to cede uh, my time uh, and be mostly just the time keeper and forego my prepared introduction notes having said that i'll still use my prerogative as the chair to flag one issue uh, this so you have muted yourself yeah uh, is it now okay yeah yes. yeah monish okay Yes sir please go ahead sir now it's okay okay having said that i would like to use my prerogative as the chair to flag one issue which the three speakers may like to address we as analysts generally tend to study discuss and then look at various aspects of an issue and then arrive at a conclusion in a very dispassionate manner we have been doing it this afternoon in the present case also while we can discuss the presidential election scenario uh, we should also see uh, as, uh, i mean in addition to saying as to how the people are going to react how they are going to vote who is going to win etc same time once we have analyzed the issue we must ask ourselves the question as to how would that affect us as a nation is you know, and the end result which end result would be beneficial to us you know in another couple of months one of the two declared candidates will emerge victorious the outcome will certainly affect the united states and the americans and also seriously affect other nations both friends and foes india will be certainly affected now that india us relations have now become multifaceted and we have gone quite a distance so we must at this stage be prepared to make you know make course corrections should our expectations not 
come true or may not come true. According to me, this is my personal opinion. Historically, the grand old party has been always better disposed towards us. Of late, there have been exceptions. The Democrats this time are making the necessary and the correct noises to be able to win over uh, the various sections of the U.S. population. But then, election rhetoric and the intentions are two different things. And then, what they actually do thereafter is a third. So I, as a practitioner, more as a practitioner than as an academic, believe that we need to be mentally prepared for either of the two possibilities. The three following speakers do have the expertise and the wherewithal and the experience to advise us on what we should do, how we should keep our various options open. With that, I'm now going to invite our first speaker. Let me invite Professor. Srikant Kondapalli to tell us something about post-U.S. election, U.S.-China relations. Srikant, you have your 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Raju Gopalan. Uh, let me also thank uh, the Manipal Academy of Higher Education and the KIPS for the invite. Uh, let me quickly uh, suggest that while um, Foreign policy issues are marginal to the U.S. elections um, because much of this is uh, related to domestic uh, debate, the bread and butter issues uh, that are crucial in U.S. elections. Uh, nevertheless, there is also the uh, role of other countries. Uh, I would suggest to China as a major factor. In fact, these elections, unlike the previous elections, uh, we have seen that uh, China has become the focus. Um, uh, so this is the single most foreign policy uh, instrument in U.S. elections is China, uh, according to various observers. Um, Russia and Iran has also been part of this uh, previous in the previous elections, uh, but nevertheless, today China has become the one of the main focal areas of the U.S. elections. Um, so uh, um, this is in the background of uh, the national security strategy document and other documents of the US saying that China is a strategic competitor along with that of Russia. Uh, Russian role in the US elections was most, most explicit last time. Uh, and uh, on September 4th, the national security advisor, uh, Robert O'Brien uh, mentioned that China's role in the current elections is also quite substantial. Uh, he didn't reveal, of course, what exactly China is up it uh, uh, has uh, uh, the plans to meddle. Uh, he used the word meddling in the U.S. elections, uh, and he hinted at the cyber related. So, in terms of the infrastructure of the electoral uh, aspects we probably will see some kind of an interference. Although China's ambassador to the US, Tsui Tiankai, mentioned that he neither has an interest nor an intention to interfere in the US election process. Uh, nevertheless, we have seen some uh, writings recently of uh, how the US could play some role in the elections. Uh, but since Bill Clinton's time onwards in the 90s, uh, we have seen China has been a major uh, player in the U.S. elections uh, as an election campaign issue. Uh, Bill Clinton mentioned about democracy, uh, about the others, but soon he uh, allowed China into the WTO, first the most favored nation treatment, and then the WTO process. Uh, since then, the engagement process uh, that Henry Kissinger began with China intensified. Uh, and this is actually an irony that Americans used to interfere in the Chinese political system by trying to export democracy, raising human rights issue. And uh, in about 40 years time, we now are in a reverse position that China is interfering in the US elections. Uh, I do not know if the Chinese want uh, a communist party to be, uh, to be grown in the US or uh, 
their uh, political agenda to be carried on. Uh, but that is a far uh, thinking. Um, I think the Chinese interests are first to stabilize the relations with the US because under the Trump administration, they have seen the tariff wars uh, over 18 months. Uh, and in January this year, they have had uh, the agreement, uh, which has not been implemented despite a May uh, this year, uh, you know, um, deadline for implementing some of the agreements that were signed before uh, in January. Um, we have seen as a result, the Trump administration has expanded the strategic competition uh, between China and the US uh, in many domains. Uh, this is recently the TikTok has been banned after India banned this uh, uh, some three months ago. Uh, there is of course, uh, the trouble began with uh, the Huawei uh, chief's uh, daughter being arrested in Canada, uh, Meng Wan Wancho, uh, and uh, the, uh, the restrictions on ZTE, uh, another major telecommunication giant uh, in the in China, which is operating in various uh, uh, countries, including in the U.S., uh, ZTE had uh, bailed out uh, itself by having an agreement and a two uh, billion dollars of fine. Uh, but the Huawei is still problematic with the 5G telecommunications becoming more controversial. Um, the other restrictions put on China include the um, the 1000 uh, visa ban recently, the, also the Uyghur bill, the Tibet bill, uh, the uh, uh, deputy secretary of the US visiting Taiwan uh, recently. Uh, then there is also the, uh, the South China Sea firing incident when the Chinese have launched a missile uh, when the Americans were conducting an exercise close by. Uh, there are also the issues related to Senkaku Islands with Japan, as well as the military alliance with South Korea, um, where they have deployed the THAAD system. The Chinese made a compromise with South Korea on the terminal high altitude air defense system by not having the interceptors into the Chinese uh, territory. Uh, but uh, the, the South Koreans uh, have had the BMD system uh, in place. Uh, we have seen the Trump administration engaging in two summit level meetings with North Korean leader uh, in Hanoi and in Singapore uh, before, but it did not lead to what Pompeo had mentioned as complete and verifiable denuclearization process. Uh, the trouble between China and US is also in the spheres of uh, the, um, the uh, uh, students uh, related the media, the Houston um, consulate being shut down uh, with the charges flying around on espionage and so on. Uh, there are also the issues related to uh, the, um, the um, uh, commerce uh, and investments. Uh, the US ambassador has been uh, recalled back uh, from China uh, so there are issues that the strategic competition has really uh, impacted on Sino-US relations. Uh, as a result, the Chinese economic growth rates have come down. Uh, of course, COVID-19 uh, intensification, uh, both in China as well as in the US, uh, has been a defining moment uh, with US becoming the largest number of uh, infections as well as uh, deaths uh, so far. There has been also a psychological war China saying that it had efficiently tackled the COVID-19, while that of the U.S. administration, different uh, different places have seen uh, the infections rising. The U.S. has accused China of uh, spreading the Chinese virus, the uh, uh, Kung flu, uh, or the Wuhan virus, as Pompeo had mentioned. Uh, this has led to uh, a lot of tension between U.S. and China. Uh, so much so that they uh, are at loggerheads in South China Sea, in Taiwan Straits, uh, or in other areas. The PASEX exercises are being conducted in the South China Sea by the US Navy. And there are also some decisions taken by the US Navy, uh, in addition to the, the PECOM uh, 
changing its name to Indo-Pacific Command. There are also the redeployments of the US naval vessels. Uh, even as the Chinese were disinvited from the, um, from the uh, Pacific uh, exercises. Um, so the tension is rising and it is likely to increase uh, who will be the winning candidate. Um, Biden has mentioned about the, um, the competition uh, in many areas, especially in terms of uh, investments. The, uh, uh, in other words, there is a certain bipartisan consensus uh, within the US on China on many counts. But Biden is likely to, to revive multilateralism uh, uh, and also move closer to the NATO partners, unlike Trump administration, which also means that the recent Chinese uh, um, uh, access to 17 plus one, that is Central Europe and Eastern Europe, is likely to be addressed by Biden if he wins the elections. Uh, secondly, the, um, uh, the Biden campaign managers have mentioned about the uh, climate change proposals to be revived, uh, possibly TPP in future, uh, but, no, but definitely multilateral processes uh, and probably a soft touch towards China uh, instead of a hard touch by, uh, by Trump administration on the investments, people to people contacts, the exchanges as has been mentioned uh, in various Chinese writings uh, recently. So, um, so while Trump campaign videos have accused uh, that the, uh, with Joe Biden, uh, China is in charge, um, the slogan that was announced, uh, we also see the Biden campaigners uh, have been very critical of how Trump had handled uh, China factor uh, and also COVID-19 related aspects. So um, the, the, the bipartisan consensus nevertheless uh, would mean that we will probably see uh, from November uh, the strategic competition in place um, uh, and the, uh, the, the um, um, various other uh, measures uh, should be in place. Now, how does China interfere in this? Uh, United States has about 2.56 million Chinese, uh, overseas Chinese who have been, become uh, American citizens. Uh, although they form just about 1.5% of the population, we have seen recently that China has been using WeChat, which is now banned, of course, by the Trump administration, uh, or other social networking sites in order to put up uh, a unified position. Although in the last elections, the overseas Chinese turnout has been just about 40, 40 odd percentage. Um, we could possibly see a higher voter percentage uh, here uh, in these elections by the overseas Chinese. Uh, we have seen the chambers of commerce uh, where China has been uh, instrumental and influential uh, in carrying out some agenda. Um, we could probably see these chambers of commerce uh, playing a very active role in the mobilization of the voters uh, uh, in the uh, November uh, elections. Uh, there has been also the overseas Chinese concern with the COVID-19 discrimination, the ethnic profiling and uh, uh, others. So uh, the overseas Chinese are likely to uh, take a more um, uh, anti-Republican position uh, while the uh, Democrats may actually have some um, more popularity from the overseas Chinese uh, voting for them. Um, Kamala Harris as a Chinese name, uh, uh, she, of course, her family business with China was criticized recently. Um, uh, nevertheless, it is likely that she may garner much of the uh, overseas Chinese voting pattern. Um, the students and residents uh, are likely to play a bigger role in spreading the awareness campaign. Uh, finally, I would say that the Chinese commentators, uh, both at the government level, media level, scholarly level, uh, they have taken a position of psychological warfare. Uh, number one, criticizing the US elections in general for the corruption, for the money factor, for the interest groups uh, factor. Uh, and have uh, lampooned, in a way, the US election process. Uh, this psychological warfare uh, 
uh, has been a major uh, element. Although at the government level, they said they, we will not interfere in the US elections, which is a big statement of course. Uh, 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 there are some scholars uh, like Wu Xinpo, Yan Shui um, uh, and various other American uh, experts in People's University, Tsinghua University, Beijing University and Futan University. Uh, they have been watching uh, and giving out handouts in the local press in China uh, regularly. Their overall opinion has been look at the pathetic situation the US has in terms of the COVID-19 related. Uh, secondly, they have also touched upon the, uh, the uh, long-term effects of the bipartisan consensus on China in the US politics. So the, you, the Chinese are looking for a long-term um, uh, solution for this and uh, a decoupling they are, they are prepared for with the US. Uh, in such a case, then they would probably be uh, enhancing the, uh, the effects of decoupling on the Chinese economy. Uh, number one, they have uh, looked at the, uh, the double uh, circulation strategy. Uh, domestic as well as the external. Even while reviving the supply chain mechanism, uh, they are going without the US uh, as a factor in the supply chain mechanism and economic growth rates, number one. Number two, they are going to intensify the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, um, uh, because, because this is uh, away from the US influence uh, in the continental and the maritime domain. Uh, and so there is a likelihood that they would intensify the BRI. Uh, overall, then it appears that there is uh, US and China at loggerheads for five more years at least, uh, which also means a um, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy is likely to be intensified uh, with India playing a bigger role in this. Uh, we have already seen in the background of the Galwan, uh, the B-52 bombers have been shifted to the uh, to Digo Varsha. Uh, providing some kind of an assurance for India in the light of the DF-26 mobilization in Tibet uh, and neutralizing the Indian Air Force uh, impact. So uh, there is an indirect reassurance from the US uh, and during the uh, Galwan incident, uh, it was mentioned by the White House that Trump has been watching the situation on the border between India and China. So let me stop here. Uh, uh, the impact on India is also very clear from the US-China spat uh, for the next five years. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Srikant, for that crisp uh, overview. You covered many grounds. Uh, you spoke about the uh, Chinese ambassador to the United States, you know, denying that they have any interest or intention to interfere. And there's a maxim which says, that never believe a rumor till it is officially denied. So we have a official denial uh, of this rumor. You also mentioned that while there's a bipartisan view on China, uh, the Democrats may have a soft touch. That is the phrase you used dealing with uh, China, reviving the uh, uh, cross-Atlantic relationship in Europe, but having a soft touch. Uh, so, so the mute question, uh, you haven't answered, but you have answered that uh, who among these two uh, would China prefer? Uh, now we move to our next uh, speaker, Professor Arvind Kumar, who will touch upon the international security issues post US presidential elections. Uh, Professor Kumar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm very delighted to be part of this uh, webinar and I'm very thankful to Professor Mahapatra for giving me this particular theme. I think this theme is very relevant because I think he analyzes the overall U.S. positioning since 1945. The United States always wanted to be seen as a global leader. They always portrayed themselves that they have the ability to lead the world affairs. And they assumed that they have got all the wherewithals to deal with the emerging challenges, including the global security issues. And in that context, what happened? They, instead of 
making the globe peace and stable, achieving peace and stability, I think they really created a lot of challenges for the rest of the world. So my assumption would be that whether it is going to be a Democrat taking over the White House or the Republican taking over the White House, they still will perceive their preeminence as the major priority for their administration. The larger global security questions which are emerging in the current context obviously are because of the advances made in the science and technology. More and more advances, whether it is outer space or for that matter, any other development which the defense technology has been witnessing, I think the United States obviously has been posing a lot of challenges. And in that context, a lot of these strategic technologies which have come up, which are largely in response to a competition which the US really posed to the rest of the world. China's rise poses a lot of threats to the United States. Their increasing presence in South China Sea, their increasing presence uh, obviously to their power trajectory across the maritime domain, obviously have been posing a lot of security questions. And in that context, they obviously have been emphasizing on how best they can build certain very constructive strategic partnership with the countries which can work together in dissuading the growing influence of China in the Indo-Pacific region. So the challenges are going to be far too many. Whether it is Democrat or Republican, they have to deal with these challenges. Last four years in particular have been, to my understanding, have been very troublesome for the US allies. In the last seven decades, if one common element, if one finds in the US foreign policy, it happened to be the alliance building, alliance system. President Trump has defied the alliance system. They have forgotten their allies. So instead of making more friends, the US basically, in the current context, has obviously created a lot of mistrust among their own allies. And in that context, a lot of the security questions really are completely varied. West Asia, you can take, for example, and that certainly remains a part of the larger debate, especially in terms of the US policy, that how that has created a larger global security question. When the US announced that Israel's capital is going to be shifted, so in the shifted, and also that whole question of Jerusalem is going to be the new, new uh, this uh, capital, that really posed a lot of challenge for the whole of the Middle East. This is everything because of the United States. It's really from India, we have to use the word West Asia. So, whenever you should take even South Asia for that matter, the major challenge which the rest of the world has been witnessing is from terrorism. If one really does a study on global terrorism index, Afghanistan tops the list. Has the US been able to improve the situation in the last two decades when they launched the global war on terrorism? The questions are far too more, I don't know, getting more complicated. So the global security questions will remain complicated whether it is Democrats taking over or the Republicans taking over. There are a lot of indications which are coming up, especially in the context of the United States advances in the technological sphere, where the nuclear question is featuring again with a lot of prominence. They would like to revive their uh, nuclear uh, technology in a big manner. In that context, they have put moratorium on the nuclear test in the early part of the 90s, in 1992. They have not tested any device, but now there is a move that they might resume testing, especially in the context of addressing to, to their needs. Because nuclear weapon also has certain, in fact, uh, the life uh, time. And in that context, the, the overall replacement of the old weapons, old warheads, with the newer ones, which we are doing through the computer testing, that will be done by testing in the atmosphere. So the resumption of these obviously will pose a lot of challenges to the rest of the world. So likewise, I can give you a lot of examples. And this, again, is not in the context of that the US has been moving towards this. This is largely because of the response which they are making, especially in the context of understanding China's strategic allies and China's power position. So obviously, I think the, the whole uh, strategic position of uh, President Trump, we have to draw inferences. But what exactly they would like to uh, achieve, especially in 
the area of the dominance so south asia again always has featured prominently as a part of the us priority us strategy west asia again has been uh, a part of their priority south east asia again because of their interest and they really find that region to be a uh, very important region because of as you know the, the world trade the sea lines of communism and the various other features because that they want to protect and secure now the us is desperate to, to really have certain very i don't know trustworthy partners they have disowned their own allies but now they are looking for the trustworthy partner and that is how i think a lot of these debates which are happening is in the field of quad and quad plus and these are largely to really see that how is they can contain the growing influence of china in the indo pacific region so what i mean to say here a lot of these issues are going to be very primary especially in the context of their understanding of the world system and addressing to the questions which might emanate from their actions because their policy obviously impacts the rest of the world iran is a very good example how much time president obama spent in terms of bringing iran on their side having that uh, the, the uh, overall uh, agreement that was joint comprehensive plan of action and what happened it has really been abrogated and ultimately without understanding the larger implications for the abrogation the question again remain uh, i don't know complex because iran's aspirations grew iran obviously is sitting on the threshold any time they can demonstrate their nuclear weapons capability and that would again be very very i don't know unstable for the whole of west asia in general and the us in particular so i think a lot of these policies which president trump really took that was the basically he did nothing but in the last four years he had just did in fact uh, he changed all the policies whatever president obama had taken rolling back and obviously finding uh, uh, us a place for us but somehow he could not do it the latest threat basically which is uh, related to the pandemic which obviously would really be continuing and that obviously has impacted the united states not only in the form of the human lives but also in the form of uh, the larger us economy and that perhaps again would be a good lesson for the us to understand these many emerging predicaments the global economy is receding is shrinking and in that context i think the us will have the larger role to play largely because they really have uh, as you know that they really have the largest economy in the world still they have 20 trillion economy a lot of the threats which they perceive when they articulate what is their immediate threat medium term long term threat they obviously really see the whole world that is why their presence basically in terms of having a larger global surveillance system in terms of their technology that obviously started way back in the 50s so advances in every sphere of a strategic uh, technologies these really have led the us to address to their challenges but at the same time understanding the larger issues from the various other threats which are obviously emerging even if you can take the case study of us taliban peace dialogue has it really ended any divisions in the last four years really have been i think professor kundapuri pointed out very correctly last four years really have seen the us transition from multilateralism to isolationism now how again that transition will happen if joe biden comes so a lot of this posturing which the us really did especially in the context of promoting the us interest that means the major part of the debate but at the same time the threat perceptions which are being uh, perceived by the us would be far too many in every sphere and now there there are lot of countries which are coming as a competitor is not only china russia already was there now china has come in a big way in every sphere and even if they really have lot of antagonistic posturing against china these are not going to help the us in any way so how is in fact there can be a balance especially in terms of protecting their interest again would very much depend on having a comprehensive assessment done on the threat perception which they perceive in the in the current context and how that could be addressed by the us in the foreseeable future so what i mean to say here that a lot of these issues which are coming especially from the changing dynamics of geopolitics and also for the advances made in the science and technology these would impact the us presidency whether it is democrat uh, coming uh, as a uh, taking over as white house or whether it is republican so i will stop it here if uh, there are anything i can answer later. thank you very much
Thank you. <clears throat> that was a, a almost a, a, you know overview of the security situation. Uh, what I would um, take from uh, your what you said was that uh, uh, Trump, um, you know, in his attempt to undo Obama, did many things which are very relevant to international security. But irrespective of who occupies the the White House, there could be shades of how they handle it. But the U.S. interests, which have been threatened by the rise of China, they will have to address it. And how they address it, the degrees could be different. But there won't be uh, much change. That, that's my take. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And now for the final speaker for this session, Professor Mahapatra will speak about India and the United States, what we can expect. After November. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I think I'll speak without my video so that it can be more clear. Uh, with the, sometimes with the video and the audio together, uh, either audio is not working well or video is not working well. So let me uh, make a few remarks only because we are running almost more than half an hour late. I'll not uh, make a long presentation. Uh, I'll just try to raise a few questions and then try to answer. Of course, your, your main question is, who is good for India and what may happen to India's relationship? I'll answer that. But before that, let me make a few uh, remarks. Number one, uh, if there would have been a seminar like this just about a few months ago, and then uh, one would ask, who do you think is going to win? Uh, majority of them, in my view, would have said Trump is bound to lose. Why? Number one, he has not been able to fix the healthcare system in the United States. Number two, he wanted to change the even Obamacare, and he has failed to do that. And the largest number of people in the world are in the U.S. who have died because of coronavirus. And this guy is no good. Number two. He has been behaving like an authoritarian leader, and he has uh, kicked out so many high officials uh, during his term uh, that uh, the administration did not appear to be really stable, that democracy is in real danger in the United States. One of the longest uh, democracy in the world is facing such a problem because of this authoritarian leader who has no control over what, whatever he says and who he tweets sometimes contradict, contradictory things every other day, he is not a leader that the U.S. really requires. Next, there is a leader who has worked out of his, the, the responsibility of the U.S. from world affairs, and uh, he has stopped leading the world. He has worked out of WHO and the Paris Climate Agreement, and even the Iran nuclear deal and the TPP. Uh, what does he want? At a time when the liberal international order was already under stress, the U.S. leader, particularly Donald Trump administration, had pushed a liberal order into further chaos, and it is going to create a systemic problem in the world. Next, there is an administration who may have increased the tariff against the Chinese and apparently trying to fix the trade deficit within the country, but this uh, administration also ignored whatever has been happening in Xinjiang province, whatever the Chinese did in Hong Kong, whatever they have been doing in South China Sea. Not enough has been done by the Trump administration, only money, money, money and trade deficit, nothing else. In other words, when the U.S. has been debating about the relative decline of the U.S. from world affairs for a long time, Trump administration is hastening that uh, direction. And China has really emerged as a big challenger to the U.S. That is why this guy is no good. Let us not vote him to power at all. This would have been the impression of many people in the U.S. and outside. But today, after hearing so many presentations uh, since this afternoon, you know, the main question that everybody has raised is if Trump wins the election, what will happen? If uh, Joe Biden wins the election, what will happen? 
And the extrapolation has been, this has been the Republican Party posters, the Democratic Party posters, and if they come back to power, this will happen ABCD. Right? That shows that we cannot say for certain that Trump is going to lose now, at the moment. That's very clear. If you go by the opinion poll, by and large, we think that the American opinion, opinion poll uh, polls are very reliable. But of late, everybody has realized that even if in the national poll, a particular candidate is winning, and at the moment, Joe Biden is winning by 8 to 9%, that is no guarantee that Joe Biden is going to win the election. In spite of all the failings, insulting the women left and right, insulting the American military people, particularly the veterans, and irrespective of his behavior towards you know, African-Americans, and the way he was trying to break the law and order situation in the USA, the way he behaved when uh, some people were protesting near the White House, et cetera, et cetera. In spite of all these, now people think that the electoral college calculation can be totally different. That is why now people are keeping their fingers crossed and Donald Trump may come back to power. If that is the case, then now let me say very, very briefly about uh, Indo-US uh, relationship, the impact of uh, the election on uh, Indo-US relationship, and then I'll conclude. Now here, let me also underline that for a pretty long time, the Indian Americans uh, living in the USA did not have much of a role in American politics. Now, every passing year, that role is becoming more and more and more. Today, the, Indo, uh, the Indian American community, particularly the Hindus there, they have become so active. There is a large group of Hindu, uh, you know, Trump campaign for Hindus. Then there is also another group which is now supporting Joe Biden and they are able to raise millions of dollars. Then they are saying that, well, in 2016, one of the reasons why Donald Trump actually won the election was because of the Hindu, Hindu support. And Donald Trump himself and his family members, they visited the Hindu temples in Florida and uh, I think in New Jersey or some such place. And uh, so Donald Trump is the right person who is going to promote religious freedom in the USA. And although some people think that he's supporting the white supremacists, I think for the Hindus, he's, he's okay. And they're supporting him. And some of them supporting him because of the Modi factor. Modi went there and there was a big rally, it was a big success. And then Donald Trump comes here, it was also a big success. And these people are going to support uh, Donald Trump. However, there are also another group who is supporting uh, um, Joe Biden. What does it mean? It simply means, just like the way the Indian diplomacy works, and the Indian diplomacy typically does not take side and make things black and white. Similar is the behavior pattern of large number of Indian Americans in the USA. So whoever may occupy the White House after the election, I think India will be okay. If we make an analysis, the, the reason I'm saying this is uh, based on certain historical understanding. If we analyze the Indo-US relationship, particularly from 2000 onwards, then we realize that uh, during every administration, Bill Clinton or Obama or George Bush or Donald Trump, you know, we have found there are good things and bad things in both the administration. The Democrats are more favorable towards the idea of, uh, you know, liberalism and then uh, multilateralism and promoting arms control and disarmament and non political initiatives. And some of those initiatives actually did not uh, support India's position. So when Obama actually won the election, all of us are worried, Abhi kya hoga India ka? this guy is going to talk about NPT and CTPT yet again. What will happen to the strategic partnership and one, two, three agreement? But nothing happened, ultimately. And when the Republicans come to power, then there are certain areas where Indians feel very comfortable. For example, even Donald Trump, who has a very caustic tongue about so many issues and so many people, by and large, his administration has maintained quietness as far as the Kashmir issue is concerned, or the CAA protection in, in, in India is concerned. Only a handful, not handful, um, only a few members of the Congress, they raise the point, 
but the US administration has, has been by and large non-interfering in the internal affairs of India. So we'll feel comfortable if Donald Trump comes to power. So in other words, you know, whether Trump comes to power or Biden comes to power, it is not going to bring about a large material change in the nature of Indo-US relationship. India is well prepared and uh, India is in a good position to handle either. So that is why we keep on repeating there is a bipartisan consensus in the USA about promoting relationship with India. India is not a threat. India is not going to be a threat in the foreseeable future. So the relationship is going to go through similar little bit of hiccups on certain issues, but the Indo-US strategic partnership uh, will continue to grow. And that is going to happen. For India, we know that even Trump administration was more critical of China and Pakistan. So we felt pretty good. If Trump comes back to power, what is going to happen? Number one, I think uh, the liberal order is further going to go down and uh, it will be more transactional relationship around the world. Number two, the uncertainty, the uncertainty uh, that surrounds the Trump administration and his behavior, the way he makes policy, he on makes policy now, that is going to continue. So we can expect certain amount of uh, uncertainty and we have to, or manage our diplomacy accordingly. Number three, I think US-China relationship is going to face more and more problem. There is going to be an economic cold war, not uh, real uh, hot cold war hotspots of the kind we saw during the last 40 years of US-US relationship. And then India has to make up its mind whether the time has come to really forget about this so-called doctrine of strategic autonomy. And because of this rise of the Chinese threat, we should take a clear cut position and go much closer towards the United States, sort of uh, signing an alliance agreement. You know. It is more likely on a Trump administration than under the uh, Joe Biden administration. So these are some of the thoughts that I thought I would share because of the time uh, factor, I'm not going to continue. Uh, this is an issue that needs at least one day uh, seminar. So let me uh, stop here, but I'm prepared to uh, answer any question if there are any. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Mahapatra, for that. Uh, uh, neither here nor there, sort of thing. <laughs> but uh, I did uh, hear you saying that uh, there is not going to be large material change in the relationship uh, if there's a change in, in the White House. But you did go deeper into uh, how. Uh, uh, Trump's opinion on items or subjects of uh, of strategic interest or critical interest to India is that he has been more uh, uh, speaking our language than that of our detractors. Uh, so, end of the day, um, it is saying that irrespective of who comes in the White House, India uh, will deal with them and. India-US relations have now reached a level that uh, there could be a shared difference in how we deal with each other or shared difference in whether um, a particular uh, you know, a sector uh, moves up or down. But more or less, this relationship has been established and will continue to move. With that, thank you very much, Professor uh, 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 Mahapatra, for saying that. Uh, we are really over short of time. I do not know <clears throat> whether if do you have time for Q and A. In which case, Monish, uh, <clears throat> uh, over to you. You kindly handle that. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, due to the paucity of time, uh, we sincerely apologize uh, regarding the lack of a Q and A session. But uh, certainly, this is uh, only the first. Uh, I believe in the. A series of uh, sessions like this that we are going to have in the future. Uh, thank you, um, Chair, Sir, uh, Ambassador R. Raja Gopalan, uh, for um, such a wonderful session. Uh, and thank you to all the esteemed speakers uh, for having dwelt on, uh, you know, on the big picture as well as the details of 
it's of uh, the bilaterals as well as the larger international security issues. Uh, now I would like to uh, request uh, my dear colleague and the director of KIPS, uh, Dr. Netaji Abhinandan, uh, to give his concluding remarks. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Monish. Uh, esteemed uh, panelists, all the distinguished uh, scholars, experts, uh, students, uh, and all my esteemed teachers. Uh, it was a wonderful Saturday afternoon uh, to, uh, whereby we discussed threadbare all the aspects, different aspects of 2020 US presidential elections, internal dynamics and global impact. And uh, the credit goes to Professor Chintamani Mahapatra, the founder chairman of Kalinga Institute of Indo-Pacific Studies, and uh, most importantly, Professor Arvin Kumar of Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Uh, I, uh, I take this opportunity on behalf of Kalinga Institute of Indo-Pacific Studies to thank uh, all those who have made this possible. Uh, though in virtual mode, for the first time, this collaboration has taken place between uh, Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, and Kalinga Institute of Indo-Pacific Studies. Uh, while the former is a veteran, the latter is a young child, uh, and Professor Arvind Kumar uh, is the common binding factor, and uh, he's just like a father figure to uh, Kalinga Institute of Indo-Pacific Studies. And I must uh, inform all of you are aware it's a kind of family that keeps us truly arrived uh, in the think tank scene uh, with innumerable uh, national and international webinars uh, for last uh, six, seven months, programs and workshops, and also publishing very thought-provoking commentaries uh, on its website. Uh, so uh, this, is a, this is a moment uh, of in a, in a kind of uh, celebration. Uh, and also this collaboration would go further in having this kind of events in future. Uh, this is a phase of counter narratives. Uh, globalization has moved into a phase uh, which is being dubbed as deglobalization, witnessing a certain kind of backlash. And also, after being used to American dominance for more than five decades in world politics, we may very well enter into a phase of de-Americanization of world politics and uh, a kind of chaotic multipolar world order. Uh, it will be largely determined by the outcome of 2020 presidential elections. So whether uh, so these are interesting times, these are challenging times, whether the US would maintain its uh, the top stand against China and its assertions, whether the friendship between the oldest and the largest democracy will intensify, we will watch out. And maybe after 2020 presidential elections, Keith and uh, Mahe uh, would join hands to have not a virtual but a real uh, uh, conference on the impact of the election on world politics and uh, security issues. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a very, very good beginning in terms of collaboration and having this webinar. And uh, I hope and expect uh, this journey will continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abhinandan, uh, for your remarks, uh, kind remarks, and uh, really uh, being a force uh, behind KIPS and this collaboration with uh, the Department of Geopolitics and IR. Um, I'll Take one or two minutes, uh, you know, uh, not to sum up what has been done. Uh, there is very little to add. I just want to say that it has been a pleasurable Saturday afternoon and evening uh, and because because I got the privilege uh, to listen uh, to those who have literally taught me the ABC of American politics and US foreign policy and uh, many more experts uh, who have, uh, you know, given their mind uh, to not only American politics and US foreign policy, but to help us better understand how this complex world works and how uh, India can navigate uh, the geopolitics of this complex world that we are entering into. Uh, I think what we have done today is really interesting, at least from my point of view, because I think it opens up this window, uh, not only to think more about how to think about American politics, but also uh, to think about how to write and how to talk about American politics and also to think about 
how to teach about American politics and how to transmit this knowledge that I have gained uh, from uh, everyone uh, to uh, you know who, whomever I have the opportunity of uh, sharing a classroom with. Uh, I think uh, what we have delineated today is really, uh, I think, interesting in terms of looking at uh, both the process and the outcome of the U.S. election. Uh, as they say in U.S., uh, you know, not, not everybody wants to see how sources are met. But what we have done today is to really see how things are done, uh, you know, all the complexities of uh, the American political process, and also to locate that within a larger picture of a power transition of sorts, which is happening, whether that will be uh, accommodative, cooperative, confrontational, and conflictual is uh, something that we have to wait and uh, watch out for. And I think this is really important for uh, the choices that India is going to make, uh, and also to ask at what cost are we going to make the choices that we are going to make in the times to come. Uh, having said that, uh, I, I really take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, you know all the distinguished chairs and all the eminent speakers who have taken out time from their very busy and hectic schedule uh, to make this event, to make this uh, very important discussion a success. Uh, uh, all the doyens of their own fields who have uh, really enlighten us and we stand uh, and I think all of us will agree with me that we stand much more enlightened on all these issues than we were at three o'clock uh, today in the afternoon. Um, so I thank all the distinguished chairs and speakers who have graced this occasion and made this event a whole success. I thank all the young scholars who presented uh, you know very interesting papers um, and I thank my colleagues at the department who, who have really helped out in terms of making this event a success. Uh, the students of the department as well as participants uh, who have joined uh, from outside the institution to make this event a success. Uh, la last but not the least, I extend my heartfelt thanks to uh, the brains behind this uh, uh, discussion and national webinar, uh, Professor Chintamani Mahapatra, uh, the founding chairman of KIPS and rector of JNU, and Professor Arvind Kumar, uh, head and professor of the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations. Um, I uh, request uh, the two conveners, uh, Professor Chintamani Mahapatra and Professor Arvind Kumar, uh, to have the last words uh, before we conclude this session. Uh, professor Chintamani Mahapatra, sir, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I wish to thank uh, each and every one who are part of this exercise. This is the first, not the last. I will have more and more occasion to meet on different issues at different times. And uh, I wish you all the best in your academic pursuit. This is an issue that is going to affect politics, economy, history, strategy, society, everything. So that's why I keep a tab on who is going to win the American election. Moreover, someday I think we should have a webinar on how the election is fought in the USA, particularly the procedural aspect. And many people who are not aware of it, it's a very confusing, complex process and all. And for the students particularly, it will be really illuminating if uh, one of you can uh, you know, present uh, something on the process of the election uh, in, in the US. And uh, let me also thank Professor Arvind Kumar for doing almost everything, all logistics to make it happen. And all the, um, uh, paper presenters and the chairs were here, and I think it was a wonderful system. Uh, we enjoyed it a lot and we learned a great deal. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Sincere thanks to you. Uh, I uh, welcome Professor Arvind Kumar to have the last word, sir, please. Let me acknowledge that it was a good beginning. And the collaboration in KIPS obviously will keep continuing. I think we have to really do a lot of these type of events. I think this is the only way by which we can understand each other's perception. And obviously that will enhance the learning of our students and all of us. Thank you, Professor Jindamani Mapatra, the founding chairman of KIPS and the director of JNU, for suggesting this theme to us. And obviously it has come out very well. This is what I see. I see a large number of students who have attended this particular webinar. And uh, that shows their interest in this type of uh, discussion meetings. And this is the way we have to move forward. I thank all the chairs, all the distinguished uh, speakers, and obviously the students who participated, who attended. 
and it has come out a really a good uh, webinar. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Moniz, for really uh, coordinating this whole event. And uh, obviously, we have to do a number of these type of uh, events for the students and for all of us. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.